So a few things before we start. Um, first off, hi. If you don't know, I'm uh, MJ Newman. Um, I'm lead developer of Arkham Horror the Card Game and also the author of this YA novel, uh, Dark Drifters, The Key and the Crescent, which we're going to be reading act one of today, right now. If you didn't know that, you've come to the wrong stream. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing. We've got a bunch of people here. Uh, I'll go through and I'll, we'll do introductions real quick, but um, we're not all going to be on screen at the same time. We'll, we're going to rotate based on who's reading which chapters. We've kind of divvied it all out. So um, we might have to do a little bit of organization on the fly. That's fine. Uh, so yeah, um, why don't we go through and quickly introduce ourselves, starting from the top left and then going across each row. Sound good? Okay, so starting with Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin. You can just say your name or you can say things about you if you have things to say. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Josh? Uh, hi, I am Josh Parrish and I run the Tuesday Night Call of Cthulhu for this poor, poor lady to suffer through. <laughs> Uh, Tim. Hi, uh, I'm Tim, and I don't know that I have too much to add to that. Uh, all right, <laughs> Chris. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Chris Maka, and looking forward to reading some of this story for everybody. Thank you. Uh, is it uh, James or Jim? Which one do you prefer? Uh, go for James. Uh, I'm James. I play various card games that MJ designs and uh, discovered she also writes fiction, and here I am. <laughs> and somehow you've reached here. Well, I've already introduced myself, so skip me. Mora? Hi, I'm Mora. I'm also really excited to read. And Lenny? Hi, I'm Lenny, and in so many words, Senpai noticed me, so. <laughs> uh, well, consider yourself noticed. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah, um, it says Caitlin's a little quiet, so I'm going to raise you. Don't worry, Caitlin, you don't have to do anything. I'm just going to raise your volume up a little bit. Um, if while we're doing this, uh, someone's a little quiet, just mention it in the chat. I'll fix it. And yeah, we'll be good to go. Um, everything else good? Is my audio fine? I know I'm using a microphone that sometimes occasionally picks up the audio from my desktop, which um, makes me want to choke out uh, children, um, but I'm not going to do that on stream, so no worries. All right, uh, where can you get the book? If you're reading, if you're watching and you like what you see or what you hear, you can find my book on my personal website, um, www.bewaretheblackcat.com. <laughs> Sorry, my brother is in the chat right now saying that I'm way too loud. Hey, Dave, I have something for you. Okay, anyway. Um, you can find that on my personal website, bewaretheblackcat.com beware or on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com. Um, so check it out, please. Uh, all right, so a couple quick explanations. Um, there's some weird text in this book that makes uh, audio book format really challenging. So... What we're going to do is we're going to try to gloss over the parts that don't really make sense. Um, or, uh, so there's, there's parts that are like a text message exchange between two characters. Whenever that comes up in the text, we'll, we'll kind of head that off and then we'll go through the text messages as if it were voice acted. Um, there's also like weird nightmare speech. Um, whenever that happens, I don't plan on having us recreate it because the whole point of it thematically is that it's garbled and incomprehensible. So instead, what I plan on doing is when we get to that, I'll call it out. I'll be like, and there's some nightmare speak and I'll type it into the chat. And that way everyone who's watching can see it and be like, oh, that sounds creepy. And we'll move on. Sound good? Uh, and then finally, um, I thought about adding music um, in the background. But ultimately, I decided not to because I didn't want to get content ID'd and then the whole thing would get muted upon recording. And the whole point of recording this was to have it to listen to. So that would be bad. Um, are we all good to go? 
All right. So real quick content warning. Um, this book has some uh, ableist slurs, and it also contains scenes depicting bullying, physical abuse, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and explicit violence involving children. So if any of those are red flags to you, if any of those are things that you don't want to hear, um, please leave. I will not be offended. That's fine. That's what the content warning is there for. Um, all right. So uh, quick prologue, preface. What is the drift? I can't answer that. At least not in any way you might find satisfactory. The drift is real, and yet it is an illusion. It is everything you and I have ever experienced, and also nothing at the same time. It is completely meaningless, and yet it is absolutely vital. This may sound like a riddle, but it is all true. The drift is a place that exists in all of our dreams, or perhaps it is more accurate to say that our dreams take place within the drift and its infinite realms. Dreams of sorrow and regret, dreams of hope and ambition, dreams of fantasy and imagination, and then there are the nightmares. Nightmares aren't just fleeting figments of horror. They are corrupting influences that can infest other realms. When the spread of nightmare threatens to overtake the drift and infect the prime reality, only those beings who can travel from one dream to the next can draw in the nightmare and slay it once and for all. These drifters live by a simple mantra. Protect the drift, slay the nightmare, free the Mara, do not go dark. All right, I'm excited. So we're going to start with uh, chapter one, which is going to be uh, myself and Caitlin, and that's it, nobody else. So you'll see the two of us on screen. And I'm just going to quickly, I forgot to send out a tweet. <laughs> Very important. Okay. Tweet set. I did it. Can you tell I'm super organized? All right, cool. Uh, close tab. All right, here we go. So act one, chapter one, Penelope. Thou canst run from anything but thyself. An anonymous cat's wisdom. <clears throat> I'm falling again. Mom never taught me how to fly, only how to fall. The wind bites into my flesh and tears feathers from my wings. Red mist obscures my fate, but what lies below is certain. There will be no end to this torment unless the end is my own. My flock circles above me in perfect ignorance of my descent. This journey is for me and me alone. Bitter resignation gnaws at my insides. I've always been alone, and I always will be, a wing-clipped bird plummeting downward in a silent, cruel spiral of feathers through an endless, airless, joyless sky. I turn, spread my wings, and brace for an impact that will never come. No clouds, no sun, no atmosphere above me, only an, only an endless alabaster stairway spiraling around a pitch black obelisk. The obelisk reaches up into infinity like a razor sharp needle piercing the fabric of space itself. Its foundation is a flat surface flanked by pillars of sharp onyx, a cat's paw with its claws extended. No, not its foundation, it's the pinnacle. Am I upside down? I'm not falling, I'm soaring. I fly through a spray of red mist. I'm close to my true destination now, a destination I didn't choose for myself, but which I get closer to every time. As I turn once more to face my fate, I catch a glimpse of that thing emerging from the ocean of blood that spans all around me. It's a creature so foul, so hideous, so rotten to its core, I can't admit I'm looking directly at myself. It's agony to gaze upon it. It is a mirror showing only the worst of me. It opens a hundred jaws, and in that familiar, terrible voice, it tells me the truth. A truth I already know. A truth I refuse to accept. A truth both harsh and unassailable. When I jerk awake, I'm sweating so profusely that my pillow and bed sheets are soaked. My fingers are shaking uncontrollably. Street lights press into my bedroom through the curtains behind my futon. Crickets chirp outside. A nightmare. I crawl out of my bed. Every muscle aches with pain. Just another nightmare. It takes every shred of energy to stand up, and somehow twice as much to totter across my cramped studio apartment to my tiny bathroom. I force myself to examine my reflection. 
A tinge of darkness coils within the irises of my eyes. Only a nightmare. But that darkness, it's so much more, isn't it? Something I've carried with me for a long, long time. I shudder and turn away from the mirror. In my bedroom, cold light still shines from the screen of my laptop. She wouldn't understand. I collapse into my chair, swipe at the touchpad, and pull up my chat log with my girlfriend. Do I message her? No. If it's this late here, it's just after lunch where she is. She probably has class soon. I'd just be burdening her even more. I shouldn't. Nonetheless, I can't stop myself. Now talking in a private channel with Emerald Wings. Opened by you, Delirious Moon 23, on Tuesday, October 16th, 2.48 a.m. Hey. Hey. Let me guess. You can't sleep? Wow, you're so perceptive. Such genius. Much wow, etc. No need for sass. What time is it over there anyway? Like 2 a.m.? You know, I'm like 100% sass, right? It's more like 3. I can't sleep. Sorry. What's on your mind? I don't know. A lot. I miss you. I miss Suki. Suki is fine. He's curled up on your chair. He misses you too. Of course he's fine. He has you to take care of him. He's lucky. I've just been having bad nightmares lately. You mean worse than usual? Yeah. It's like my mind has too much going on inside it. And everything keeps bursting out. All these terrible thoughts. And they stay with me all day. Do you want to talk to me about them? Maybe I can help. You can't. Nobody can. Sweetie, you know you can always talk to me about anything. I love you. I want you to be happy. I'm sorry. I don't mean to burden you. You're always so thoughtful, even when you have your own shit to deal with. Hey, stop. You're not a burden. Honestly. <laughs> sure. I know the crap that people say about us. Like what? About how bad of a girlfriend I am how I'm not worth your attention, how much easier your life would be if you didn't have to deal with my shit all the time. That's all bull. It's not true. You're there for me just as often as I'm there for you. <laughs> no. I ran off to Japan just as school was getting tough for you. I'm literally not there for you. Oh, stop. You know I supported your term abroad. That's exactly my point. You're always supporting me, and I'm nothing but a burden. You should just forget about me and my problems and focus on yourself. Have you tried talking with anybody about this? Maybe chat with Atsuko? <laughs> like Atsuko would give a shit. She barely knows me. What about a therapist? What, in Japanese? I can barely order food. There is such a thing as online therapy, you know. I'll do some research and send you some links. How would any therapist be able to understand this? They're just going to think of being silly or overdramatic. Not at all. They are totally valid feelings. But you need to talk to somebody about them. If not me, then somebody else. But how can I do that without becoming a burden to them, too? Shit. I gotta go. Class is starting any second now. Please don't worry about being a burden. I'm here for you, and so is Atsuko. You can talk to her. I promise. Get some sleep, okay? I love you. I'll try. I love you, too. Sorry for everything. I slam the laptop shut so hard I nearly crack the screen. I wipe tears from my eyes. She wouldn't understand if I told her the truth. Even now, a darkness tugs at the edges of my sight like claws attempting to pull me back into a nightmarish slumber. It's not like I don't want to sleep. I'm exhausted. I just can't bear what happens whenever I do. It's far better to stay awake. That damn nightmare haunts me everywhere. That ocean. That voice. Rogue droplets of rain tap against the window next to me. I pull the curtain aside, and I'm met by the cold glare of neon lights. It's impossible to enjoy my semester in Shinjuku when every night is like this. Worse yet, I left behind the only person I could confide in. I even left behind my lovely little Tsuki, who used to sleep curled up alongside my neck and purr right into my ear. Even just the absence of that gentle thrum is an emptiness that bores into my chest when I lie down. What compelled me to think I could handle this on my own? This place is nothing like that silly dream I used to have. That dream of the glorious, perfect apartment in that towering city of neon lights. The view from that balcony above the mists it always put my heart at ease. The, colorf the colorful posters reminded me of my childhood. There were pictures of my friends, a nicer television than I've ever had, and a peaceful little drawing studio. But in reality, 
I have this tiny, shitty studio apartment in a city I know nothing about. I'm too tired and anxious to even bother decorating the place. The view from my balcony just makes me tremble. The crowds outside aren't soothing at all. Not like they are in my dream. Why couldn't I have just stayed there? No, I just had to come and see this place in person. And now when I fall asleep, that dream has vanished. Stolen from me by this horrid nightmare. What an idiot. An absolute idiot. Darkness slithers into my room from every corner, smothering my sight like some kind of infestation. I can't go back to sleep. Not now. Not yet. I have to get out of here. I throw on my raincoat, tie my hair into a messy pink ponytail, <laughs> and creep out of my apartment. The tiny sign next to my door reads, Penelope. I turn away in disgust. If only I could be anybody else. I close the door quietly behind me and descend eight flights of narrow stone steps. Out the main door and into the drizzling rain I go. Nobody ever sees my nightly excursions, and nobody who does would even give a damn. I have no agenda, no purpose, no reason, not for my nightly walks or for anything else. I try my best to ignore the graffiti along the building's outside walls, most especially my own, a somber portrait of Tsuki. I feel him gazing quizzically at me as I leave the apartment complex behind. I pass storefront after storefront, each darker and more barren than the next. A staircase descending into darkness draws my attention. I read the sign above the stairs, Kabukicho, my local subway station. If I cared for my safety, I wouldn't be walking down these steps into a silent, shadowy tunnel beneath the streets, not this late at night. And yet, here I go, taking my first steps below, using the map on the wall to memorize the layout of the subway, rattling the locked gate that leads deeper into the tunnel to see if it's okay to see if it'll open. That's okay. This is good enough. I haven't added a subway to my dream city yet, so this will be a fine addition. Even if it's incomplete, I can fill out the rest of myself. Besides, I'm fading. Fast. This will have to do. It'll take too long to get home. I head to a secluded bench in the darkness and lie down, covering my body with my coat. I have to dream now, or I'll lose my grip on this place. My mind teems with visions of spotless subway platforms, joyfully rattling train cars, brightly lit vending machines selling whatsoever the heart desires. This is the only way for me to avoid the nightmare. The only way to ever find rest. I have to visit the city in my dreams to build upon it and strengthen it, add structure and sound and substance, or that voice will find me again. I drift off without realizing what exactly I'm building a home for. All right. Yay. That is chapter one. So now we've got chapter two with Lenny, James, and Mora. And I will vanish. <laughs> chapter two. Poppy. Drifters are not born. Drifters are chosen. We only wish we could do the choosing. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. Poppy woke with a shudder. The vestiges of some vague, twisting nightmare retreated from her mind as reality came into focus. Super Metroid was paused. Her tiny CRTV based, bathed her attic hideaway in a dark blue glow. Somehow, miraculously, she'd hit pause while she was drifting off. She'd been trying to beat the game in under three hours and unlock its secret ending for months. But she never would if she kept falling asleep at the game unpaused. Thanks to her condition, it would probably never happen. After all, Poppy Eatles could never sleep when she wanted to, and always slept when she was supposed to stay awake. She yawned and pulled the blanket around her, wiggling her butt against the wooden floor to get comfortable again. Her clock read 12.43 a.m. There was time. She was quick and clever. She could still beat the game before she fell asleep again. She knew every secret in A Link to the Past and had Star Fox down to a science. If there was one thing she was good at, it was video games. But all the practice, all the reflexes, and even all the cheat codes in the world could never fix the one thing that stood in the way of Poppy's perfect speedrun. Her mom called her lazy, but it wasn't her fault. Or at least, she didn't think it was. That one nice doctor tried to explain it one time, but mom had thrown his pamphlet in the trash and claimed he was just making up excuses. It wasn't just mom, either. Poppy's teachers accused her of the same thing. She was lazy. She had no discipline. She had problems learning. And the kids in her class, well, they just called her weird. Falling asleep in class was one thing. Every kid did that from time to time. But falling asleep in gym class, during recess, in line at the cafeteria? And who could forget the time she fell asleep on the toilet in the girls' room after lunch? She didn't wake up until an hour after school was out. Her classmates had mocked her for weeks about that one. 
But, all, but for all the sleep Poppy got throughout the day, her nights were filled with restless energy. Maybe if Daddy were still around and she could fall asleep curled in his lap with his gentle hand stroking her hair, she'd be able to sleep well like she used to. But ever since he left, she could no longer sleep for more than an hour at a time without her dreams turning dark and grisly. When that happened, when that happened, it was best not to sleep. So here, Poppy found her escape, in her house's dark, cluttered attic, tucked away above the second floor hallway outside her bedroom. It was the only place where she could enjoy herself whenever she woke up in the middle of the night, which was just about every night. One of these days, Mom would catch her up in the attic, huddled under her blanket with her face ten inches away from the television screen, and she'd drag Poppy back to her bedroom, screaming about how no wonder you're so goddamn lazy all the time, staying up all night playing that damn video machine. But until that night came, she'd continue hiding up here, where she was never mocked or judged, where she was alone, safe, free. Sleep already tugged at her senses. There was almost no chance she'd be able to beat Super Metroid before she, drift off, before she drifted off again. This wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last. Dozens spawned dozens of times before, but each try, she got a little quicker, a little smarter, a little better. One day, she'd unlock the secret ending. She had to. She gripped her Super Nintendo controller tight and hovered her thumb over the start button. And that's when she saw the flash of two gleaming yellow eyes. A cat was sitting behind a stack of VCR tapes. A black cat with a coat so dark, Poppy could barely see the creature at all but for its bright, gleaming stare. It lifted up its head, peered into Poppy's eyes, and blinked. All of this was particularly strange, since Poppy didn't have a cat. She put her controller down, leaned forward, and beckoned the cat closer. Hey, kitty, come on. The cat stepped out from behind her stack of Sailor Moon tapes and climbed onto her lap, rolling into a warm ball of black fur. Good kitty. He whispered, petting its soft, silk soft fur. Where did you come from? Maybe Mom had surprised her with the pet, she'd, pet cat she'd always begged for, but that was unlikely. For one thing, she'd pulled up the wooden ladder and closed the hatch shut, like she always did whenever she snuck up to the, uh, off to the attic at night. More importantly, Mom was adamant about never getting Poppy any pet, since she was, according to Mom, too lazy to ever care for one. Are you a stray? She whispered, as if the creature could reply. It peered up at her, and only then did she notice its collar, the same coal-black color as the cat's fur. I guess not. A silver pendant shaped like a crescent moon dangled from the collar. Who? She lifted the pendant up and examined it closely. It bore no name, no phone number, and no address. Curiously, a silver chain also wove through the pendant, wrapping loosely around the cat's neck along with its collar. The black cat stretched and purred. Poppy scratched its chin and rubbed behind its ears. Her eyes wandered to Luna, the black cat on the cover of her topmost Sailor Moon tape. This is just like how Serena became Sailor Moon. In her vivid imagination, she was about to become the world's worst Sailor Scout. Sailor Sleepy, they'd call her, because she'd fall asleep mid-transformation. Poppy giggled at the thought. The cat pawed gently at her elbow as if it got the joke. Luckily for Poppy, the creature didn't mule, hiss, squeak, or make any noise that might attract the attention of her mom downstairs. It merely sat there, pawing at Poppy's hands and staring at her with uncanny persistence. She stared back. And as she met its gaze, the jet black void of its pupils widened like the aperture of a camera, and she saw. The obelisk reaches into the heavens. Its shifting onyx stones and clockwork gears split the silvery clouds as it rises. Its foundation lies thousands of leagues below. Its pinnacle pierces the firmament of the universe and extends to worlds beyond. An infinite stairway of alabaster steps spirals up the dark obelisk in a mesmerizing, gravity-defying array. Scaling that which pierces the heart of all realities is the climber, a hunter of an impossible quarry, a hunter who has forsaken her weapon and treads upon forbidden ground. Without her glimmering, silver-handled sword, she stands no chance against the final horror at the end of her quest. And yet... She has a will to match her missing blade steel. Her faithful countenance belies the certain doom that lies ahead of her. Captive in her left eye is the dark fury of a raging hurricane. In her right, a bright tranquility that attracts the gaze of a hundred thousand unseen predators. 
Her raven hair weaves in the wind as she climbs, her warm brown skin juxtaposed against the garden of clouds that surrounds the sable tower. The farther she climbs, the darker it will get. Darker and darker and darker until there's nothing left but utter madness. Poppy jerked back, her forehead emerging from within the cats. Her head struck the wooden shelf behind her. Ow! She shouted before slapping her hand over her mouth to muffle herself. What did I just see? Who the hell was that? And as she peered around once more around her attic, she noticed it had changed. A slick and dark shadow seeped in from between the cracks in the wood. Wisps of black mist snaked in through the window, and the curtains that had once swayed in the gentle breeze were now ragged and spattered with filthy stains. Her television now showed nothing but white and black static. Everything was suddenly clearer. Lines, harsher, colors, more striking. Poppy's eyes were adjusting to the darkness, or perhaps they were adjusting to the very concept of darkness. What the hell did you do to me? She asked the cat, trying to rub the strange sensation out of her eyes. The black cat hopped off her lap and onto the sagging shelf above her head. Mom had thrown out all the photos of her parents' wedding and her early childhood right after Daddy left. Now it was home to just a family of spiders and the few books Poppy owned. The cat knocked him over to kill a mockingbird, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. Hey, stop! What are you doing? She hissed. If the black cat cared about the mess it was making, it certainly showed no reaction. It ran to the far side of the shelf and nudged a folded pamphlet with its nose. The pamphlet? The one she'd rescued from the trash and hidden behind her books if her mom threw it away. She knew every word by heart. What is narcolepsy? Narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder of excessive daytime sleepiness. It may occur with other symptoms such as cataplexy, sleep paralysis, and hallucinations. It was a complicated piece of paper for Poppy. Proof that there really was something wrong with her, and, well, proof that there was really something wrong with her. Showing it to the teachers or, or kids at school wouldn't help. It would only make them laugh at her even more. Hey, get away from that. She snapped, snatching the pamphlet from under the cat's nose. It gave her an uncanny glare. Could you stop making such a mess? She pleaded. The cat simply stared at the black cat simply stared at the pamphlet. Even though Poppy had read it cover to cover many times before, she glanced at it once again and this time read, Why do you even exist? Nobody wants you here anyway. You're a burden, a freak, a worthless child with no friends and an overactive imagination. You're the reason why daddy isn't here anymore. You're the reason why mom hates you. You're nothing, nothing, nothing. Poppy threw the pamphlet to the ground and backed up against the window. How? Dark mist encircled her, and her eyes strained to focus in the gloom. N no, it, it, it doesn't say that. She stammered, as if, her words, as if her words would somehow change what she'd seen. A faint, discordant whistling drew her attention to her backyard. She turned and looked out the window. The first thing that drew her gaze was the scarlet-red full moon hanging in the night sky and the black shapes over the harbor, twisting and churning beyond the clouds. The ocean to the north, Usually a dark blue that blended with the blackness of the night sky was tinged the color of fresh blood. In the distance, at the edge of the cliff overlooking the bay, stood the old lighthouse. The pride of her hometown. Its beacon pierced the red sky with a ray of complete and utter blackness. What the... Poppy muttered, a shiver coursed up her spine. This is wrong. This is all wrong. The soft scratching of nails on wood pulled her attention away from the window and back to the dock. It was clawing at Daddy's old dresser, now devoid of any of his clothes. Its eyes darted around as it crept along the dresser like it was searching for something. It stopped in a framed Polaroid of her and Daddy at Disney World on her seventh birthday. Her light red hair was frazzled and unkempt as usual. Her round cheeks were flushed pink with joy and she wore an enormous grin, the kind of grin she rarely saw in the mirror these days. Her hair was pulled into two bushy pigtails because that was about as good as Daddy could do. A bright silver tiara hung just below her hairline. Daddy wore a shirt that read Led Zeppelin whatever that meant. That was a little over four years ago. Poppy hadn't grown nearly as much as she'd have liked since then. Her hair was still bushy and untamed, since Mom never helped with her with her hair and brushing was impossible. She often preferred to wear it in the same style as in the photo, with two long pigtails draped over her shoulders. The freckles across her cheeks and nose were hiding due to all the time she spent indoors, but in the sunlight they covered her face like a pox. The strange cat stared at the photo for a long time, almost like it recognized the scene. Then it spotted something else on the other side of the room and bounded across the floor. Wait, what are you looking for? Poppy whispered. I'm dreaming, right? Just wake me up. I don't like this dream one bit. 
The cat had other ideas. It dashed over to the old trunk on the other side of the floor hatch, stood on its hind legs, and swatted at the unlocked padlock several times. Then it turned to regard Poppy once more, its eyes gleaming with uncanny intelligence. Poppy crawled to the trunk, unhooked the padlock, and threw open the lid. The cat leaped inside immediately and started fishing for something. The trunk was full of Daddy's old belongings. She'd gone through it before, but it never found anything worth holding on to. It was all manila folders filled with boring documents she'd never understand, moldy old binders brimming with photos of people she never met, and a brass key. She'd seen it before, but the damn thing was useless. It was a book to be, a candle bearing a delicately carved Victorian pattern that was more ornamental than functional. It was short, with two simple teeth, and far too wide to fit into any lock she'd ever seen. It opened not a single one in the entire house. The cat emerged from the trunk with her father's brass key in its mouth and trotted over to the window, quest complete. Hey, where are you going? That's dad is. She complained. The cat ignored her and hopped onto the sill of the open attic window. With a sudden surge, Poppy's head pulsed with pain. She gasped with panic as the weight of the entire universe started crushing her skull from all sides. What is this? What's happening to me? She could barely see through her own tears as pressure seared into her brain. Come down from there. She gasped, trying to coax the cat, reaching out with her hand. It faced her one last time. Its yellow eyes flashed with light reflected from the crimson moon. Then it flicked back its head, opened its mouth wide, swallowed her father's key in its entirety, and vaulted from the windowsill. No! She lunged to grab the cat, but she couldn't get to the window in time. When she poked her head out through the window frame, it wasn't the gnarled branches of the tall oak tree she saw. It wasn't even her backyard. It was suddenly hundreds, no, thousands of feet from the ground. The rest of her town lay sprawled out around her, looking like some kind of twisted diorama from this height. Beyond the edges of her town, there was nothing. Not just nothing, but truly nothing. Only the cold, empty void of the cosmos. Her attic was no longer even part of her simple split-level home, but looked out from a twisting, towering obelisk of black onyx. A sinister structure that rose and rose and rose into the sky, towering so high it had no end. A stairway of narrow, white steps spiraled up around it. Far above its peak swirled an impossibly vast ocean of crimson-red blood. The ocean stretched into the distance, spanning from horizon to horizon like the ceiling of a planetarium. Poppy suddenly felt smaller than she'd ever felt before. Come on. Wake up. Wake up. She pleaded, but no matter how hard she tried, there was no waking from this dream. Is it all real? The black cat stood upon the obelisk steps, gazing over its shoulder as if to coax her to follow. In her reflection in the window, Poppy saw that her pupils were vertical now, just like the cat's. Below the creaky wooden floor came the telltale tap, tap, tap of her mom walking through the second floor hallway. A demented voice followed. Poppy, are you asleep? It was like the grating of metal, nails on a chalkboard, a hideous croaking, and her mother's angriest voice all at once. It wormed its way into her ears and caused her eardrums to bleed. Poppy's heart pounded in her chest. I have to get out of here. Without a second thought, she climbed out the window and onto the stairway surrounding the obelisk. The cat dashed up the steps with the kind of grace only cats possess. Poppy started after it, suddenly drawn to a halt by the distance to the ground, the narrow width of the steps, the swiftness of the bitter winds, the roaring of the ocean that loomed overhead. Poppy! The voice cried out from inside. Poppy flinched and scrambled faster up the steps. All around her, reality continued to twist and bend. Beyond the confines of her small harbor town, the infinite stars glistened. Countless galaxies, worlds, lives, destinies, all of it laid out before her. And at the nexus of it all, the ominous black obelisk and a maelstrom of crimson blood. Where have I seen all this all before? A familiar terror wrested control of her nightmare adult mind. She climbed frantically, breathlessly, but the top seemed ever further away. As the stairway vanished from beneath her feet, the black cat clawed at the silver pendant on its collar, ripped it off, and leaped into her arms. The moment her fingertips touched the cat's lustrous fur, she snapped awake for the second time that night. Once again, Poppy was sitting under the blanket covers, staring into the cold radiance of her television set. A thin stream of morning light peeked through the closed attic window. Something cold and metallic pressed snugly against her throat. No mysterious black cat. But most importantly of all, Super Metroid was no longer paused. The game had probably been running for several hours. She tacked the clock and left up in a panic. Her failed speed run was the least of her concerns. If she wasn't downstairs and dressed for school in five minutes, she'd never hear the end of it from her mother. 
Poppy quickly shut off her Nintendo, covered it in her blanket, and hid it on the bottom row of the shelf behind her. She lowered the attic ladder and crept to her bedroom as quietly as possible to prevent her mother from discovering her nightly routine. Since Mom was too busy to dress or feed her, Poppy was on her own every morning. Within five minutes, she had thrown, a ran she'd thrown on a random combination of clashing colors, dumped way too much kicks into a bowl practically overflowing with milk, and wolfed it down while watching cartoons in the living room. Then she called out to Mom that she would be walking to school early and hustled out of the house. As usual, there was no response. Throughout the rest of the day, Poppy couldn't get her mind off that vivid dream. It was real. It was so real. More real than all of this, even. She felt as though a curtain had been hanging over her every second of her life, and for the first time she yanked that curtain aside to reveal the truth, the majesty of imagination, or the depths of insanity, one or the other, or perhaps they were one and the same. It wasn't until she arrived at school that she felt a weight dangling from her neck. She groped at it, and her hand found a moon-shaped pendant hanging from a silver chain. It wasn't hers, but she recognized it instantly. That was the first time Poppy ever <laughs> ah that was so good oh my god <laughs> great job everyone thank you um all right awesome yeah i i know i mentioned i might be doing the nightmare text in the chat but i decided to uh more i just wanted to do it so i was like yeah do it do it it'll be cool so we'll just do that from now on all right so chapter three I've got Caitlin and James again, and I will take this role of uh, Charlotte. So, uh, are we good to keep going for now? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. Chapter three, Charlotte. The duty of a drifter is to observe and to react. The curse of a drifter is the inability to observe oneself, an anonymous cat's wisdom. Charlotte's head shot up the moment Poppy entered the classroom. Never before had she seen Poppy Eatles arrive before the bus kids. The redhead wore an expression of shock to match Charlotte's open mouth. Poppy scanned the room as if to check if she was being pranked. Thanks to her on strict routine, driving her to and from school early every single day, Charlotte Bashara was always the first to get to class, and Poppy was often the last. Neither of them participated in the bus journey. All of the other kids chatting and laughing at jokes the two girls would never get to hear. Given how everyone mocked the redhead who sat next to Charlotte, it was no wonder she took her time to get to school. Charlotte knew all of the gossip, of course. Poppy was the freak who fell asleep every hour, who would probably fall asleep in the middle of a busy street one day and get run over by a truck, har, har, har. An adult had said that once, one of the many reasons Charlotte didn't care for adults. The other kids in the class were no better. They called Poppy names like dumbass and nerd all the time behind her back, often not even behind her back. They just waited until she was asleep and then said them right to her face. Charlotte would hold her breath and stifle herself in the hopes they would stop. They never did. Charlotte watched Poppy hang up her coat in the cubby labeled Poppy, noticing that somebody had scribbled out her name and written Sleeping Ugly over it. Jack Hayward's handiwork, no doubt. He was the boy who sat behind them, a runt of a kid two inches shorter than everyone else in class, with scrawny legs and bony arms. But that never stopped him from picking on Poppy day in and day out. His ratty blonde hair always looked overdue for a haircut, and he wore dirty, disheveled clothes, often several sizes too large for him. Jack tormented Poppy nearly every day. He'd throw pens at her while she was asleep, rip up her drawings, and call her names like freak and moron. Worst of all, he would convince the rest of the class to join in. Charlotte wished she could muster the courage to say something, but would choke every time. Whatever poor, unfortunate soul befriended Poppy would receive the same treatment, or worse. The redhead either didn't notice the spiteful nicknames or made a show of ignoring it. She slumped at her desk next to Charlotte, pulled out her marble notebook, and immediately began to draw. Charlotte watched in silence. She probably doesn't even want friends. Poppy was always throwing herself headlong into anything fictional. The comics and books tucked into her backpack were evidence of that, as was the Game Boy poking out of its front pocket. Charlotte narrowed her eyes, wishing for a taste of that kind of freedom. A fire stirred within her one she'd never fed. This was the first time the two of them had ever been alone together. She tried and failed to pry her eyes away. What is she thinking? What's she really like? Does she even know I exist? Solving puzzles was Charlotte's favorite thing in the world. Her backpack was overfilled with extra reading material. She went through marble notebooks like they were going out of style. 
Whenever Mr. Donovan assigned them a ton of homework, all the other kids would groan and complain. She'd smile to herself. And when the school counselor had asked what her least favorite subject was, she answered, recess. Luckily, thanks to Aunt Caitlin, schoolwork occupied most of her time at home. In her free time, she devoured word scrambles, math problems, and other logic puzzles. And if she could hide her puzzle book inside a school textbook, sometimes she could fool her aunt. Aunt Caitlin set the rules, and there were many, many rules. The puzzle she wanted to solve the most was the mystery of the red-haired girl who sat next to her. What are you drawing? The words exited her mouth before she even realized she'd said them out loud. Poppy practically jumped out of her seat. Huh? Uh, nothing. Was her response. She glowered at her unfinished picture. Charlotte's heart resumed beating. She opened her own notebook and compared the two. In hers, she'd kept a diligent record of everything she learned in class. Poppy's, on the other hand, was filled to the brim with random drawings, strange diagrams, and unfinished homework that Charlotte felt the insatiable urge to complete. They couldn't be more different. The same was true for Poppy's short frame, pale skin, and unruly hair. Charlotte was the tallest girl in class, golden brown skin and long, straight black hair. Without looking up, Poppy hunched her body over her book to block Charlotte's view. Come on, please tell me. Charlotte lowered her voice, even though they were alone in the room. Are you drawing something that you dreamed about? She spent more time sleeping through class than she did paying attention. And when she awoke, she would open her notebook and scribble away. Charlotte would peer over to see her drawing all sorts of fantastical things. Aliens, witches, demons, swords, the works. The stuff of her dreams it had to be. Charlotte envied Poppy for her imagination. She would try to do the same, yet saw nothing in her mind's eye. The last time she tried to draw anything interesting, it wound up being a series of boring geometric shapes with no rhyme or reason to it. She was so embarrassed, she excused herself from class and threw her notebook in the garbage can next to the bathroom. The scratching of pencil on paper stopped. Poppy flipped her notebook shut over her thumb. She looked towards Charlotte. Do you really want to know? Her lips were curled in a tentative, skeptical smile. Charlotte beamed and nodded. Poppy glanced from side to side, as if expecting to see onlookers watching and snickering. It wouldn't be the first time somebody had feigned interest in her drawing just to make fun of her. Charlotte tried to reassure the redhead by edging a little closer and lowering her voice again. It's okay. You can show me. Even if there was somebody outside trying to eavesdrop, they wouldn't be able to hear. Poppy looked away from her and bit the inside of her lip. Okay. Okay, but you have to promise not to laugh. She stammered. I promise. I promise. Charlotte replied. Please show me. The red-haired girl hesitantly opened her marble notebook to the page held by her thumb. There in pencil, it read. 4.0 times 1.1 equals 4.4. 4.0 times 1.2 equals 4.8. 4.0 times 1.3 equals 5.2. 4.0 times 1.5 equals 5.6. No, 6. 4.0 times 2.0 equals 8.0. 4.0 times 2.5 is 10. 4.0 times 2.75 equals... Who cares? 4.0 times 3.15. 4.0 times 3.33. And then a, a series of, of names crossed out. Salem, Finks, Roger, Artemis, Hearth, Heathcliff. And lastly, not crossed out, Atticus. And in the margins was drawn the outline of a thin cat, half shaded in. Charlotte pointed at the sketch. Uh, is that cat what you dreamed about? It, it's not just any cat. It's a nightmare cat. Poppy clarified. Charlotte stared at her as if she had spoken in another language. A nightmare cat? To her surprise, Poppy launched into a description of shadows and staircases and endless oceans in the sky. A nightmare that sounded too outrageous to be real but too precise to be merely a dream. It was bizarre and detailed and so vivid. Charlotte had dreamed many strange things, but nothing like the twisted nightmare Poppy described. What a curious girl. Poppy was turning out to be even more of a puzzle than Charlotte had expected. So what do you think it all means? 
The redhead shrugged and responded while fighting off a yawn. My dreams never mean anything. It's all just, like, whatever. Probably geek, you know? Charlotte's eyes glanced back to Poppy's notebook. Then why did you name the cat? Poppy blinked at her. The names in your notebook. Charlotte pointed out. You were picking out a name for him, right? And you chose Atticus. Why? I don't know, because, like, he seemed really smart, and Atticus Finch is really smart, and I guess because I was up in the attic, so... She trailed off, perhaps in disappointment that her clever name was not all too clever after all. No, silly. Charlotte stifled a giggle. I wasn't asking why you named it. I I wasn't asking why you named it Atticus. I meant, why did you name it at all? That is, if it was all just a dream. Poppy opened her mouth to reply, froze, and then simply muttered, Smarty pants. Nobody had ever called Charlotte smart. Hardworking, maybe, but not smart. Not even her aunt or uncle. Especially not her aunt or uncle. But then, as far as Charlotte could remember, nobody in class had ever called Poppy something playful like silly. It was usually dumbass or freak or worse. She had a flash of insight. You don't think it was just a dream, do you? Poppy folded her arms and stared out the classroom window. It didn't feel like my other dreams. It felt real. Atticus felt real. And it felt like he was trying to tell me something, trying to show me something. Poppy brushed her fingers over the silver pendant on a thin chain around her neck. One Charlotte had never seen her wear before. Do you want to see him again? She wondered aloud. Poppy turned and gazed into Charlotte's eyes for the very first time, and there, for the briefest of moments, Charlotte saw something peculiar. A twisting shadow peeked out from behind the black circle of Poppy's pupil, then vanished the moment it was spotted. It reminded her of the way bugs skittered away into the cracks of the wall whenever you shone a light on them. Charlotte's heart thumped loudly. Her throat felt dry. The door burst open, and the bus kids began to trickle into the room. Charlotte paid them no heed. For the first time in her life, she didn't care about class or schoolwork or anything else. Poppy Eatles was a complete mystery, one that Charlotte was determined to work out. And more than anything, she wanted to know what on earth that darkness was. How, she didn't entirely know. She was good at puzzles, and she started to hatch a plan. She nodded to Poppy before the room got too busy. Maybe I can help. Yay. All right. So, that leads us to chapter four. I realized before I haven't been saying who's going to do which role, so for the purposes of the viewers, I'll do that from now on. Um, So, chapter four. uh, Tim's going to be narrating and playing the role of Penelope, uh, and then Mora is going to be playing uh, her friend Atsuko, and Chris is going to be Emerald Wings, her girlfriend from afar. And I'm going to vanish again. (laughs) Chapter 4. Penelope. No drifter is truly alone, for they bring the drift with them everywhere they go. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. I writhe awake. A thousand marbles bounce around inside my skull. My head throbs. Oh, damn it. It was working. It was working. As expected, even with me groaning in pain and cursing in English, none of the onlookers in the subway notice me. Or more likely, they pretend not to. I pull down the coat I've used as a blanket and slip my phone out. 12.29 p.m., two missed calls, 11 messages. Private message received Wednesday, October 17th at 9.14 a.m. from Koi. Hey, Penelope, are you home? Knock, knock, knock. Let's get some breakfast, bitch. Okay, guess not. Bye. Atsuko. How convenient. She might be my only friend here in Shinjuku, but we're not actually that close. I've only known her for about a year, after all. She was my partner in Japanese class back home. She had no intention of taking this semester abroad with me at first, 
Then suddenly she declared that she was coming too. She kept saying it was so she could visit her grandfather and her nephews in Shinjuku, but sometimes I wonder. It's like every time I'm in the middle of some kind of breakdown, there she is. If I didn't know any better, I'd say the girl was psychic. Then I read the rest of my messages, and things become a little clearer. Private message received Wednesday, October 17th at 9.26 a.m. Emerald Wings. Hey, did you go somewhere after we talked earlier? I was worried, so I asked Atsuko to check up on you. She told me you weren't at your apartment. Sorry, I know I'm being overprotective. I just wish I could be there for you. I want to make sure you're okay. I'm really worried about you. Maybe you could tell me more about these nightmares you've been having. It will help, I promise. Please text me back when you get the chance. God damn it. I rub my eyes until my vision clears. Then I fire a couple of messages back to my girlfriend. Now talking in private channel with Emerald Wings. Opened by you, Delirious Moon 23, on Wednesday, October 17th, 12.31 p.m. No, no, I'm okay. Slept through Atsuko knocking at my door, that's all. I really don't need to talk about it. Sorry for worrying you. I don't like lying, especially not to her. But I'd make things even worse by telling her where I went, where I slept. There's no way she'd understand why this uncomfortable bench is preferable to my own futon. I slide my phone into my pocket, take out 200 yen coins, and practically hurl them into a vending machine. It spits out a small canned espresso drink, which I throw back as quickly as I can. I have less than 30 minutes to get to my afternoon class, and I'll need every bit of caffeine I can get my hands on. In fact, I rummage through my pockets for another two coins and bite my lip. Yeah, another can jumbles through the machine and into my hand. I dump it into my coat pocket and make my way up to street level. Being in Japan was supposed to be everything I ever dreamed of and more. Literally, the stupid recurring dream that led me here was so haunting and so compelling that it consumed my every waking thought until I finally had the courage to leave. For a few fleeting weeks, Japan was exactly as I envisioned it. I savored every bite of food, explored every street, delved headfirst into the language, the culture, the art, not to mention all the manga and arcade games a nerd could ever want. But that was then, and this is now. I'm tired. So tired. All the time. And I struggle to enjoy anything. I feel alone in a city of almost three million. Not because I'm a gaijin. After all, there are plenty of other foreigners at my particular school. Not because Atsuko is my only friend here in Shinjuku, or at least the only one who speaks fluent English. No, it's none of that. It's the damn nightmares. And they're getting worse. Almost like they're malicious. Intelligent. Nobody would understand. Not even if I tried to tell them. They stare at my feet as I walk. I just wish I could get some rest. Even just one night. Anything. As I draw nearer to the campus, a red light and a do not walk sign forces me to pause. I catch a glimpse of myself in the window of the electronics door. And my heart sinks. My hair is disheveled and unruly. The pink dye is starting to fade. Even though I technically slept for several uninterrupted hours last night, dark circles hang under my bloodshot eyes. Harbingers of my past and future despair. My face is even paler than normal. It isn't fair. A dream is supposed to be my safe place. Why wasn't it working? Something small and furry moves inside my reflection, making me squint. No, not inside my reflection. It's on the other side of the glass in the store. I shudder and step back out of reflex, almost walking into the street. I must be seeing things. Lack of sleep and all that. I shake my head and wrap my arms across my chest. Just get to class. My mind is playing tricks on me. That's not Raji, you dumbass. There's obviously no way my girlfriend's cat is here in Shinjuku. They're both 7,000 miles away.
Woohoo! Great job. Awesome. That was awesome. Uh, all right. That was chapter four. Chapter five. Are we good to keep going? Do we want to take a pause or are we good? Okay. All right. So chapter five, Caitlin is going to be narrating. Uh, James, you're going to keep going with Poppy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mora, you're going to be Charlotte. Uh, I'm going to be a vision. <laughs> You'll see. And Chris, uh, you're going to be Charlotte's Aunt Catelyn. All right. Are we ready to go? Let's... Chapter 5. Poppy. It is said that the eyes are a gateway to the soul. This is true. But only with a drifter's eyes can one truly peer through this gateway. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. A hand on Poppy's shoulder shook her gently awake. Hey, wake up. My aunt's here. She inhaled and rubbed some life back into her face. A small, sky-blue car drove through the gates across the parking lot and approached the entrance to their school, where the two girls were waiting, sat waiting. Poppy shuddered. It wasn't a surprise she'd fallen asleep, but... Uh, James, are you, are you doing the Poppy roll? Oh, James, you're, you, you're muted. There you go. Another strange dream. She was running away from something. She had to find a place to take shelter, a place she could add to her fortress, but it was still chasing her, stalking her, a voice from beyond the veil. I'm worried about you, it mocked. It was false, cold and callous. She pulled her coat over her body and peered up at a blood-red sky. Coward. Idiot. Freak. She shook from top to bottom. Something scratched at her arm. She felt it break her skin. Crimson blood leaked from the ocean above. A droplet stuck, struck her forehead and stained her skin red. Darkness, then... Poppy scratched her arm. So, sorry. There you go apologizing again. Charlotte replied with a smile. It was true. That was probably the tenth time Poppy had apologized today. It was my idea to invite you over, remember? Poppy nodded, but she wasn't convinced. Charlotte's watchful, emerald gaze was almost stifling. She studied Poppy the same way that Poppy would read a Zelda map. Uh, James, you can read the you can read the purple and the yellow. Sorry, I've not got a highlighted one. Oh, you don't um, have a highlight. Oh, let me just, let's just hold on. Pause for a second. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> I didn't realize. Uh, let me send you the highlighted one. <laughs> sorry. Uh, here we go. Uh, so you're reading the the yellow text. Um, but yeah, no worries. <laughs> Looking for the next hidden item or something like that. You okay? Charlotte asked. A bead of sweat trickled on Poppy's forehead. Drip, drip, drip. Something dark tugged at her vision. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Yeah, it, it was nothing. She lied. It was never anything, just a dream. Those keen eyes kept dissecting Poppy's thoughts, scrutinizing her, until finally the car pulled up in front of the two girls, and forced Charlotte's attention elsewhere. The driver, who had to be Charlotte's aunt, rolled down the passenger side window and hollered. You're muted. <laughs> What's going on here? Who's your friend? Poppy would have never guessed that Charlotte and her aunt were related. There was the obvious, of course. Charlotte's skin was brown with undertones of warm gold, deep and rich in vibrant sunlight. Her eyes were bright, green, and piercing, and her hair thick and dark. She contrasted perfectly with her aunt's cold, pale skin, her harsh slate eyes, and her graying blonde curls. But more than that, she couldn't imagine this woman smiling as gently as Charlotte, or her eyes dismantling her like Charlotte's could. This is Poppy. She sits next to me in class. Charlotte explained matter-of-factly. Can she come home with us? I want to show her Dixie. 
It hadn't been much of a plan. Dixie was, apparently, the cat living in Charlotte's house. Charlotte had proposed that if Poppy saw a cat that looked like Atticus and then fell asleep, she'd be able to dream of him again. There were only two problems. One, Charlotte lived with her Aunt Caitlin, who never allowed her to have company over, ever. And two, it would only end one way. By the end of the day, Charlotte would know Poppy was a freak, just like everybody else, and she'd end up running home in tears. Charlotte's aunt pursed her lips and furrowed her brow. Before she could say no, Charlotte added, I'm going to do our homework together, too. Her aunt peered at Poppy. Oh, is that so? Well, as long as your parents know where you will be. My mom knows. Poppy lied. She doesn't get home until dinner time. Do you stay in the after school program then? Poppy nodded in response. In that case, I don't see any harm in it. But only if you get your, both get your homework done. I don't want to see either of you two slacking off. Am I understood? Two girls chanted yes in unison before clambering into the back of the car. Poppy's gaze fixed upon the scenery flying by outside. The car wove through unfamiliar streets and took an old gray bridge over a narrow expressway. A gated park flanked by thick trees sped by. She spotted a bunch of older boys playing baseball in its parking lot and bit the inside of her lip out of frustration. Last time she tried to play kickball with the other kids during recess, they laughed her off the court. Nobody wanted their outfielders fast asleep. The car rounded a corner and passed an aging split-story house with ugly yellow siding. In the front yard, the grass was just a little too long, and the wooden fence was shoddy and crooked. A rusty jeep idled in the driveway, spewing thick black smoke from its muffler. Jack Hayward sat on the front porch by himself, wearing a cast on his left leg and cradling a wooden crutch in front of his chest. Why does Jack have a cast on? Poppy muttered, craning her neck as they sped away from Jack's house. You didn't see. He got hurt during recess. Charlotte answered. All the boys were playing kickball again. He kicked a home run, but I guess he twisted his ankle or something. He was in the nurse's office for the rest of the day. It was weird. Miss Adisa was talking to a cop, too, for some reason. I'm surprised you didn't notice. I slept through recess. Poppy admitted. Oh, r- right. Charlotte turned a redder shade and turned away from her. Usually, when anyone bothered to wake her up after lunch, Poppy would climb the wooden castle playground near the fenced-in kickball court and read comics, play Pokemon on her Game Boy, or, if she was feeling particularly energetic, make believe the castle was Minas Tirith and defend it from the orcs. And, no matter what, she'd inevitably fall asleep. Charlotte's not talking. You're already messing this up. Sorry. Poppy whispered like a reflex. Why do you why do you keep saying sorry? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> she repeated again, causing Charlotte to giggle. Before long, both of them were laughing, until Charlotte's aunt silenced the both of them with the sternest of glares. When they reached Charlotte's cul-de-sac, Poppy was surprised to find one house standing out among the others. A tidy but undecorated house with bland gray siding at the center of the court. Clean and proper and boring. Every other house in the neighborhood had some Halloween decorations. Spooky plastic skeletons hanging from barren tree branches, scarecrows dressed in torn rags, jack-o'-lanterns with goofy grins, but this house had nothing of the sort. Charlotte's expression became subdued as they approached the door. Her aunt stopped at the garden in front of the house, taking some time to tisk 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 at a withered plant by the basement window. She takes her plants very seriously. Charlotte explained in a whisper. Sounds like she takes everything very seriously. Poppy added. The middle-aged woman ushered the two girls inside and warned them once more in a stern tone that... They better be doing their homework. Charlotte's home wasn't much bigger than Poppy's, but it felt twice as large without the mess that Poppy was accustomed to. The couches in the living room looked like nobody had ever sat in them, and the glass table was spotless and empty. A large, itchy-looking quilt blanket had been smoothed over the back of a nondescript couch. The house felt lonely. Charlotte took her by the wrist and pulled her upstairs into a room with an unmarked entrance. It was so featureless, it took Poppy some time to realize it was Charlotte's bedroom. There was a bunk bed for some reason, 
only the top bed of which was made. Its sheets were covered in an ugly floral pattern. In the opposite corner stood a brown wooden desk where a folder lay closed. On the front cover it read, Charlotte, enrichment class. Next to the desk was a tall dresser, and Poppy saw not a single article of clothing outside its drawers. The walls were clean and eggshell white. Charlotte had no posters, stuffed animals, action figures, or anything to hint at her interests. Had this been Poppy's room, there would have been a stack of half-read Nintendo Power magazines on the desk, and the walls would be covered in glow-in-the-dark stars. Her bed sheets would have been pink, her favorite color, instead of this expanse of dull, lifeless colors. The two girls sat on the floor and started doing their homework in dreadful, awkward silence. But Poppy couldn't focus on her math problems. Those dreams kept calling to her. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Within a few minutes, she felt her muscles weakening and her head wobbling. One of her attacks coming on. Cata something, Miss Adisa had called it. It was the worst feeling in the world. The sensation of losing all control over her muscles was something she'd never gotten used to. Charlotte's hand gripped her shoulder lightly. Poppy let out a breath she didn't realize she'd been holding. You were zoning out, Charlotte said. Sorry, I'm, I'm fine. Poppy blurted, finding that she could still move. She scooted several inches away. Charlotte's gaze followed her the whole time. More uncomfortable silence followed, but in Poppy's mind, it crashed like thunder. She had nothing in common with Charlotte, and she never would. Charlotte had raced through all her math problems in the time it took Poppy to finish one, probably incorrectly. Charlotte was some kind of super mega genius. Well, she was just a weirdo who couldn't even do math and would be asleep in the next 10 minutes. Charlotte probably has much better friends to play with, more fun things to do. Just then, a pair of glinting yellow eyes in the doorway caught her attention. Pixie? The cat entered the room with a probing mule. Poppy scooted forward and coaxed Dixie closer. She took to this attention without a second thought, nudging Poppy's hands with her nose and purring enthusiastically as she was pet from head to tail. Dixie was a black and orange calico and nothing like Atticus. She was the wrong gender, about five pounds heavier, and looked, well, normal. Is that the right word to use? Poppy scrunched her face in confusion. No, it's, it's not just that they look different. Dixie looked like a cat should. Atticus, well, somehow, he looked more like the idea of a cat than an actual cat himself. Poppy stared into Dixie's eyes, but she saw nothing. She leaned forward and touched her forehead to the cat, but nothing happened. Dixie batted Poppy's cheek with one of her paws. What are you doing? Charlotte asked. When Poppy didn't respond, Charlotte picked up Dixie onto her lap and moved closer. Is is everything okay? I don't know. Poppy said. She's really nothing like Atticus. You mean he's not a cat? Charlotte asked. Poppy shook her head and frowned. No, it's... It's more like he's the only real cat. She replied vaguely. The calico hopped off Charlotte, brushed up against Poppy's knee, climbed onto her lap, and immediately fell asleep. Save for Dixie's loud purring, silence lingered between the two girls for a long while. Charlotte finally broke the silence. Sorry, I, I really thought this would work, but... Poppy gulped. Oh, here we go, I'm... Making her uncomfortable, she's going to ask me to leave. She, she was feeling sorry for me. That's, that's the only reason she'd ever want to... If you want to go home, you can. Charlotte continued. And she had such disappointment in her voice that it silenced the myriad thoughts Poppy was listing. You want me to stay? Poppy asked. Well, yeah. Charlotte muttered. I, I just... I don't, I don't know. Wanted company. Poppy reeled. Back when Daddy was still around, he used to pat the seat on the couch next to him and put his arm around her whenever she joined him. His soothing voice would send her to sleep, and with such nice dreams. Then he was gone, and ever since, Mom barely tolerated her, and the kids at school hated her. Nobody had ever said anything about wanting her company. 
downstairs, Charlotte's aunt began to hum some awful tune. Where's her uncle? Her, her parents? I can't really be the first kid from school to ever hang out here, right? I'm sorry. Poppy said again, but this time she truly meant it. I'll come over any time you want, I promise. Charlotte's eyes lit up with hope. Pinky promise? She offered her pinky. Pinky promise. Poppy accepted. Ah, uh, yes. The old pinky promise between elementary school students. <laughs> Um, I have to say, I love the, the two of you, like, whispering conspiratorially outside in the plants. Like, that was great. <laughs> All right. Chapter six. So I'm going to be narrating and playing the role of Penelope. And Chris is going to be playing the text message exchanges with Emerald Wings, uh, Penelope's girlfriend. So ready to go? <clears throat> Chapter 6, Penelope. Those with eyes owned by, uh, honed by sorrow make the best drifters. Can you not see the dark, even when all else is bright? It lives within you, follows you. It is your shadow. Watch. See how it dances? See how it schemes? That is your darkness. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. I can't take this anymore. It didn't just look like Raji. It was Raji. It had to be. Either it was or I'm truly mad. It doesn't make sense. But then nothing makes sense anymore. Nothing. The rooftop of the university is about as quiet and secluded a place as one can get in a city as densely populated as Shinjuku. Technically, nobody's allowed up here. But that never stops students from sneaking up here to grab a smoke. Or, in my case, to stare at the skyline of the city and contemplate every decision I've ever made that led me to this moment. After several minutes of solitude, I send the message I'm dreading. Now talking in private channel with Emerald Wings, opened by you, Delirious Moon 23, on Wednesday, October 17th, 7, 12 p.m. Hey, this is going to sound really weird, but I need you to tell me if your cat is home. Her response Finally. is... Oh, sorry. Uh, her response is immediate. It always is. Finally. I've been trying to reach you all day. Are you okay? I... I don't know. Look, just listen. I, I think I really am going nuts. You're not. Would you just listen to me, damn it? Okay, okay. Sorry. I'm listening. Just tell me what happened. You were right. I didn't sleep at home last night. I haven't slept at home for the last couple weeks. What? You lied to me? Why? It's the nightmares. I, I have a way of making them go away. It's hard to explain, but I swear it works. It's the only way I can get rest. But I can't do it at home. Not anymore, anyway. I bite my lip and pace back and forth. Why is she taking so long to respond? Is she talking with somebody else? Is she in class? Am I bothering her? Of course I'm bothering her. I sound ridiculous. I shake my, my, I, sh <laughs> I shake my head, take two deep breaths, and try again. Hello? Are you still there? Sorry. Yes. Of course. So what does this have to do with Raji? I saw him on my way to class this morning. I swear to God, he was here. Are you sure you weren't dreaming? Or daydreaming? I'm positive, damn it. Please, just go look. Uh, hon, come on. What, you think my cat hopped on a flight to see you or something? Please don't mock me. I know what I saw. He was here, goddammit. I'm looking right at him. He's sitting on the windowsill right next to my desk. And Suki? Yes, your little guy is here too. They've been getting along a lot better recently. Look. You're obviously tired. Your mind can play tricks on you when you're that exhausted. I'm worried about you. You can't be walking around sleeping in strange places. You need to be sleeping in your own bed. Please, for me? No, I can't. I'm sorry. I can't do this anymore. 
Can't do what? I grip my phone hard, like I'm about to wind back and hurl it off the rooftop. If it took my worries with it, I would, but I know it can't. This, this thing where you care about me way more than I deserve, this thing where I make you worry about me all the time and probably drive you nuts. I keep pestering you with shit like this and my nightmares and then I snap at you and you react the way any normal person would. I'm an awful girlfriend. Hey, no, 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 no. Look, it's fine. You're not driving me nuts and you're not an awful girlfriend. You're wonderful and I love you, okay? Listen, I'm gonna ask Atsuko to sleep over at your place tonight. I wanna make sure that you stay at home and I wanna make sure you're okay. Please do this for me. It's not gonna work. None of this is gonna work. I have to go. I power off my phone and stuff it into my pocket. Out of sight and out of mind. It's not that I don't love her with all my heart. The problem is that I love her so much I can't bear to see her waste her life with somebody as horrendous as me. She deserves better. I peer over the edge of the rooftop, and I wonder when it got so dark. No, 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 not again! What the hell is wrong with me? I need to go find some place to add to the city in my dreams before this darkness catches up to me. I can't see Atsuko right now. I have no time. I don't want to drag them down to my level anyway. Don't they get it? The next thing I know, my feet are pounding down the stairs. I'm worried about you. Her voice is mocking me. But she doesn't understand. They couldn't understand. Being awake hurts. Being asleep hurts. Talking to her hurts. Being apart from her hurts. It's a prison of pain. And the warden is coming. Coming to torture me. Coming to mock me. I push open the glass doors of the university's main lobby and press out into the eerily dark streets of Shinjuku. I don't bother taking the train back. I'll just walk home. Kabuki-cho's close enough anyway. Maybe I'll find some place on the way. You're wonderful. What a crock of shit. She's as delusional as I was when I thought I would be happy here. That I could ever be happy. Tears stream down my cheeks as I stomp faster down the sidewalk. I pull the wide black hood of my sweater up to hide my face. I'm gasping like somebody has their hands around my throat. I can barely breathe. I have to get out. I have to get back to building my dream city. The only place where I'm safe, where I can push back against the nightmare. The warm neon lights, the pitter-patter of soothing rain, the embrace of the gentle crowds. My world spins. My body is getting sluggish. No, no, no! I dig my nails into my palms as painfully as possible. I can't fall asleep. Not yet. I almost run right past it without noticing it. A tiny playground, maybe a half a block wide. Some swings, a slide, three vending machines. It's not much, but it'll do. Nobody will see me in here. Perhaps I can even work it into my dream. I love you. No. You don't even know me. You don't know the real me. I scratch at my arm. I scratch and I scratch and scratch until I draw warm red blood. A cat's eyes glint in the moonlight. Following me? Mocking me? They vanish as I approach the slide and climb the ladder to the top. I study the layout of the park before I collapse onto my back. I don't even have the energy to pull my coat over my body this time. I feel my muscles fail almost immediately. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. You're better off without me. I can't do this anymore. I hope the voice will fade as I, too, fade, but it only grows louder and louder. Come back to me, it cries. But I can't. I can't. I just want to sleep. Please, Warden, let me sleep. A droplet of rain strikes my forehead. Darkness overtakes me. Whew. Well, shit's getting real now. <laughs> um, all right. We are getting to the good stuff now. So... Uh, are you ready for chapter seven? Josh is like, yeah. <laughs> All right. So chapter seven, Josh is going to be narrating this wonderful nightmare sequence. Uh, Caitlin is going to be playing the role of Poppy. Chris is going to be Charlotte again. Um, and Maura, you're going to be uh, Aunt Catelyn again. Um, and so there is some, uh, if I remember correctly, I think there's some nightmare speak. Maura, you can handle all of that as well. Okay. All right. Uh, let's do it. 
Chapter 7. Poppy. Thou hast two voices, one from within and one from beyond. An anonymous cat's wisdom. Poppy suddenly slammed into the floor of Charlotte's bedroom. She groaned and sat up. Her nostrils flared from the stench of something coppery and sulfuric in the, car- in the carpet. She recognized the room, Charlotte's bunk bed, her dresser, her desk, only everything was different. Charlotte and Dixie were gone, of course. The walls were adorned with pictures of famous baseball players, all them Yankees. Half the dresser drawers were open, and an unfolded boys' clothes hung out of them. Both bunk beds were fully dressed, one with dark blue sheets, the other brown. The folder on Charlotte's desk read, Charlotte, Intruder. Poppy opened it, and inside were dozens of Polaroid photos of Charlotte, all fuzzy and indistinct. Like the times when Daddy used to let Poppy take pictures with the disposable camera. Her hands would shake too, uh, her hands would shake too much trying to hold it still, and the photos would always come out blurry like that. Poppy was dreaming, that much was obvious. She'd probably fallen asleep on Charlotte's shoulder. By the time she woke up, Charlotte would have realized an annoying friend, what an annoying friend she would make, that she'd never be invited over again. She almost didn't want to wake up, if only to spare her the embarrassment of Charlotte's judging gaze. The cry of an air raid siren pierced the sky and made Poppy jump. She ran over to the window to look outside. It was the same cul-de-sac Charlotte lived on, only it wasn't. The same shape, maybe? The same semicircle of buildings, the same street, same rows of trees. However, all the houses were messed up. The wood was rotten, caved in in some places. Roofs had collapsed. Glass windows were shattered. Iron bars covered the broken panes. Everything once colorful was now withered. From the lawn to the flower bed in front of the basement window. Poppy's gaze led down the down to the end of the cul-de-sac, where the suburban street should have been. There was instead the shore of a blood-red ocean, an ocean that extended all the way to the horizon. The liquid was somewhere in between water and syrup in terms of consistency, and its surface had slow, steady waves that lapped onto the pavement of the court and stayed at red. An enormous scarlet moon hung in the hung in the sky, glowing its sinister hue. Then she spotted the entities. They were garbed in long, tattered cloaks with the hoods covering their faces, much like the ring wraith on on the cover of Poppy's edition of The Fellowship of the Ring. Each entity had three bony arms extending from underneath the folds of its mantle, two arms on the left side, one on the right. They each held up an iron lantern over their shoulder in one bony, gnarled hand. And in the other, arms were so skinny and long, they hung nearly to the ground. The lanterns were twisted and warped. The light that emanated from them was not light at all, but rather a darkness so thick and dense, it pierced even the red light cast by the moon. The entities didn't walk but floated along, several inches above the ground. She counted eight in total, each one moving slowly from door to door, patrolling the court and searching, looking, looking for, me. for me. Poppy's heart raced. She staggered backward and fell onto the carpet. The floor beneath her groaned. She had weird dreams before, but nothing like this. This was wrong. This was... A low moan sounded on the staircase outside of Charlotte's room. One of them was coming. Whatever they were, she dreaded them finding her. She scrambled to the bunk beds and crawled underneath the bottom bunk. Then held her breath and lay as quietly as she could. 
One of the creatures floated into the room, the tattered edges of its ragged cloak gliding across the carpet near inches for her face. A discordant humming emanated from it, each note worming its way painfully into Poppy's ears. She clenched her teeth against the pain, and the warm trickle of blood ran down her earlobe onto her neck. The inky void of the lantern's light passed over the bed once more, then twice. The thing chittered, then slowly, far too slowly, it floated out of the room. Poppy waited for one minute, then another, then several more. Finally, when she was absolutely sure the thing was no longer in the room or in the hallway outside, she crawled out from beneath the bed. She had to get out of here. She had to wake up. She closed her eyes and tried to make herself awake. But nothing happened. Just like the last time when she had dreamed of Atticus. There's got to be a way out somewhere. She very slowly peeked her head around Charlotte's doorframe. A foul stench emanated from the door nearest her. At the end of the hall, the stairs continued up to the third floor, or back down to the parlor where she had entered. She tiptoed to the edge of the staircase and peered downstairs. From the top step, she could see the parlor, living room, and kitchen had all changed, just like Charlotte's room. There were different paintings on the walls, different figurines on the cupboard, different furniture. It was the same house, but almost unrecognizable. Like when Daddy left and Mom brought all the new furniture for the living room. Reluctantly, Poppy descended the staircase. With each step, the floorboards creaked ever so slightly. Poppy winced. When she got to the bottom, she looked around for a way out. Not the front door. There were more of those things out there, searching for her. She ventured into the kitchen, her eyes catching a photo of Charlotte's aunt, holding hands with a man with a sharp widow's peak of black hair. Her uncle-in-law, perhaps? Two children stood in front of them, boys. Charlotte was nowhere to be seen. Poppy went down another flight of stairs into the den in search of the back door. She found a set of sliding glass doors that revealed Charlotte's backyard, its grass withered and brown. A pool of reddish liquid was seeping over the tiled floor from beneath the glass doors. It was raining outside, droplets of crimson, just like the ocean she'd seen beyond the street. She hurried to the door, her shoes splashing across the scarlet pool, and tried the door handle to no avail. She flicked the small lever next to the handle and tried again. The door slid partially open, then slammed into a, in, into a two-foot-long block of wood that had been placed in the track as a makeshift lock. It made a loud crunch, and Poppy held her breath. The discordant humming returned. She was being watched. Panicking, she kneeled and tried to pull out the wooden block, but it wouldn't budge. She'd wedged it in too tight when she tried to open the door. Who is there? A hideous, croaking voice emerged from behind her. No, 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 no. Poppy's mind raced. She slammed the door shut and pulled onto the block again. This time, it came out. You are not welcome here. The terrible voice continued. Poppy clutched the wooden block tight and spun around. Two figures stood several feet away from her. One was Charlotte, but a foot shorter than normal. Almost as short as Poppy. Her black hair was cut shorter as well, with braids along the sides that hid her thick curls. Empty, please. She said. Ma said we're family. Auntie was one of them. In horror, Poppy watched the hood slide off her misshapen but recognizable head. Her stomach turned. Up close, she saw things she hadn't noticed before. A wedding ring on the creature's third hand. Caitlin's glasses. 
The cloak wasn't a cloak at all, but a tattered, ugly blanket. Family. Not, Aunt Caitlin tilted its head to one side. You are not mine. It sneered at Charlotte. From somewhere within the dark light of its own lantern, it pulled out a pair of hedge clippers, holding them aloft in its bony hands. Poppy froze. Nobody wants you. It hummed. Get out, get out, get out, get out! Then it reached forward, snapped both ends of the hedge clippers together, and sheared off Charlotte's head. The girl's body collapsed to the ground, a fountain of crimson spraying from her neck. It was the same liquid pooling of Poppy's feet from the glass door behind her. The same liquid raining down outside. Poppy recovered her wits and cried out her friend's name in despair. She backed up to the door, trembling. The thing that wasn't really Aunt Caitlin floated towards her slowly and snapped its blood-drenched hedge clippers at her as it advanced. The darkness from its lantern shone directly at her, bathing her surroundings in deep pools of shadow that made it difficult to see. You are a distraction. It accused her. I think it didn't get your, um, you're, you're muted. <laughs> Thought I unmuted. There get away! Poppy screamed. She threw the wooden block at it, striking the creature's head. It was undeterred, and the block clattered to the ground. Poppy was unarmed. Please, please don't. She cried, collapsing to her knees. Tears ran down her cheeks. Was this still a dream? It didn't really matter anymore. Charlotte's lifeless, headless body lay in a pool of red in front of her. This must be her punishment for trying to make a friend. I should have stayed in my attic. I should stay there and never, ever leave. Wake up. Please, please wake up. She chanted to herself in between sobs, closing her eyes and rocking back and forth. It didn't work. Bring them back! The creature hissed, now inches from Poppy. She gagged from the stink of rot wafting underneath its cloak. The metallic scent of blood all around her, the sulfuric fetter from its lantern of shadows. The hunched figure in the blanket raised the hedge clippers high above its head, getting ready to stab them down into Poppy's scalp. The lantern! Poppy narrowed her eyes and drove headfirst into the pool of red, scrabbling for the wooden block. The bloody hedge clippers slammed into the ground where she had been kneeling, missing her by mere inches. Her fingers splashed in, Char in Charlotte's blood before she gripped the block tight, her stomach turning as she cried her damnedest not to look at Charlotte's disembodied head. As the creature turned to face her, she rose and swung the wooden block, only this time she aimed not for the creature itself, but for its lantern. Her aim was true. The block shattered the lantern glass, and a sudden brilliant flash of darkness filled the room. Poppy staggered back, blinking, and when her vision returned, saw the thing flailing and pivoting wildly around the room. It probed with its lantern, but no shadows emanated from within. It wailed and sobbed and hummed discordant notes. Can't see, just like when Link's lantern runs out of magic. Poppy's heart pounded with such ferocity. It was a wonder she, uh, wonder the creature couldn't hear her. Slowly, quietly, she tiptoed around the, towards the, store, the staircase. She dared not use the back door anymore, not with the creature flailing about nearby. It would have to be the front door. She placed one foot on the bottom step and leaned onto it slowly. The creature was too busy thrashing around and wailing to notice the creak. Poppy took another step, then another, gaining speed and confidence as she neared the top. When she reached the kitchen, she turned and hustled toward the front door. There were more of the things outside, but she had no other choice. 
They couldn't simply hide here forever. Poppy opened the front door and stepped out into the blood-red night. She peeked around before descending the porch steps, wisely avoiding the strange basket of rotten fruit that sat nearby. Other patrolling creatures were within sight of her, but they were far enough away that the shadows from their lanterns couldn't reach her. With no other ideas and no means of defense, she darted between the trees, bushes, and decrepit houses, traveling toward the only other noteworthy landmark in the strange nightmare realm, an ocean of red fluid she now knew to be blood. Out here, in the light of the scarlet moon, she heard sounds that sent shivers down her spine. The sentries continued humming their hideous songs. The sound of one such lullaby was bad enough, let alone the unbearable racket of eight. She felt grateful to be far enough away from the choir uh, that the choir did not drive her mad right then and there. But in the distance, the air raid siren wailed without end. The din was still dreadful enough to make her stomach sink. If she endured this cacophonous torture much longer, she would surely lose her mind. Frightful vision Char uh, of Charlotte haunting her. She stuck it to the backyards, avoiding the shadow light of the creature's lanterns on the sidewalk. In real life, the wooden fences that separated each lawn might have been a challenge. But these were so rotten and broken down that she could easily find planks to dislodge or gaps to fit through. When she rounded the corner of the final house in the court, she made her move, sprinting to the shore where the street had crumbled off into the blood-red sea. Outcroppings of road jutted into the ocean like paved jetties. Sluggish waves sloshed against the pavement in a slow cadence. She peered off to the horizon. The ocean seemed to extend the whole way. There was no other land in sight. No boats, no buoys, nothing that she could swim to. Even if she did muster the courage to set foot in into this gunk. It has stench like copper and decay. This is a nightmare. This is all just a terrible nightmare. Just then, she heard the pad of soft footsteps behind her. She spun on one foot and backed up all the way to the banks of the bloody ocean. She reflexively closed her eyes and lifted her arms to protect her. But no killing blow came. When she peeked out, all she saw was a slender cat staring back at her with eyes of amber and a dark coat of glossy, shimmering fur. The silver pendant was missing from the cat's collar, for it was still wrapped around her own neck. Atticus? She stammered, stepping forward and kneeling in front of him. The black cat turned his gaze toward the house at the end of the court. Charlotte's house. Then he looked back at her as if to remind her of something. A flood of sadness hit her. I, I know. She choked. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Charlotte, she, it. Poppy couldn't hold it in any longer. She sat on the tarmac, wrapped her arms in front of her face, and wept into her sleeves. Atticus stretched and yawned as if he didn't care. Eventually, the cat stepped forward and put a paw on her hand. But that could not console her. She cried and she cried and she cried and she cried. She didn't stop crying until she ran out of tears. Woo! Um, I hope you didn't think that this wasn't going to be a horror story. Um, if you did, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, that was chapter seven. So that leaves chapter eight. Uh, do we want to take a quick break or are we all good to keep going? People, people who will be in chapter eight. Yeah, yes, no, maybe so. Yeah, you good? Okay. All right, so for chapter eight, we've got uh, Chris is going to be narrating. Uh, I'm going to be playing the role of Poppy uh, for the first time so far. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, Mora will be Charlotte, and uh, Tim will be uh, playing the role of a strange vision. <laughs> All right, everybody good? Everybody got the right document and stuff? Okay. All right, uh, take it away, Chris. Chapter eight, Poppy. Thy first nightmare shall be thy birth. Thy final nightmare shall be thy bitter end. In between, thou art but a blade, a blade I forged for killing. So kill, Drifter. Kill and live to see the next nightmare. In Anonymous Cat's Wisdom. This is a dream, right? Poppy quietly asked Atticus. How long had she been crying? The minutes had all blended together. Time was fuzzy here. So... If I die here, will I wake up? The cat lazily swatted at a nearby fly. I once had a dream where I was falling into the ocean from a plane. Just before I hit the water, I woke up. Will it be like that? Something in the way Atticus peered at her over his shoulder said, No. I... I... She sputtered. Her voice cracked. I don't want to die. Not even in a dream. Atticus walked over and nudged her shoulder with his face. What? She looked at him with confusion. Do you want to show me something? Atticus's tail swung playfully back and forth in approval. Did he understand her? Was that possible? Poppy smoothed the cat's fur with her palm, closed her eyes, and leaned forward, placing her forehead upon his. When she opened her eyes, she was enveloped into Atticus's gaze. Oh, Poppy the Deceived, drifter of a dark dream, there is an obelisk deep in thy domain, waiting for thee to open its doors. Thou whose eyes gleam in the dark as do ours, an altar lies before thee. On it is borne the instrument of thy demise. It is but a shred of thy power, thy curse to bear thy gift to give, thy very own hell to navigate, thy very own cat eyes to open. Its blade is ever so sharp. Wield it, and thou may sharpen thyself as well. She recoiled from inside Atticus's head and fell backwards. Her left hand dipped momentarily into the bloody sea, sending an ever so tiny ripple of red into the oncoming waves. What was that? Her voice rasped. It had only been seconds, but her head swam, as though a deluge of information had been sent through her in those brief moments. Atticus's eyes shone like amber crystals. Was that you? Was that your voice? The black cat responded by opening its mouth. Sitting on its tongue was a brass key with two teeth. No. Not just a key, her key. The key from the trunk in her attic. The key Daddy left behind. The key Atticus stole the first time she dreamt of him. Poppy crawled forward and plucked the key from the cat's mouth. You still have this? Atticus meowed, as if that answered Poppy's question. Perhaps it did, and she simply couldn't understand. Is this supposed to help? She turned the key over and over in her hands, examining the delicate Victorian pattern on, in, on its handle. The curves and shapes spoke to her in a way they'd never had before. The pattern seemed important somehow, like something she knew a long time ago, but forgot. Is this a trade? Do you want this back then? She asked the cat, pointing to the moon pendant pressed against her throat. She reached behind her neck and began to take off the necklace. Atticus let out a loud whine. Suddenly, there was a rush of air, a sound like a single inward breath. The tiny ripples Poppy had sent into the ocean was growing. Somehow it crashed outward over the oncoming waves, fighting all laws of logic. The ripple combined with the rip current and swirled into an ever-growing maelstrom of blood. A bead of sweat dripped down Poppy's forehead. What the hell did I do? The necklace dropped on the floor as she looked on, frozen in place. Atticus glanced at the ocean, seized the pendant in his mouth, and scampered away. 
A whirlpool formed and exploded outward, spouting a geyser of blood high into the air, which rained down on the shore. From beneath the water, a cacophony of humming erupted, resounding across the court. Beyond the houses, more dissident humming joined the chorus. Then the nightmare emerged. Crashing out of the open, it was tremendous in size, towering dozens of feet over Poppy. It dwarfed the houses on the block and blocked out the light of the red moon. The nightmare was even more monstrous and inhuman than the lantern wielders. Eight carapace limbs came forth, dripping with crimson, long enough that they could reach halfway to Charlotte's house if they uncoiled. They were like insect legs, each as thick as a tree trunk and tipped with a sharp ebony talon. Its torso was covered, or perhaps made out of, in ooze that rolled off in undulating waves. Its face was a nebulous mass of eyes and darkness, so bizarre and unspeakable, Poppy could not bear to look. What animal has a head shaped like that? How does it hum without a mouth? Where does the muck come from? A dozen shadow lanterns floated above it, casting spotlights of inky pitch where Poppy stood. She scrambled to her feet and ran, only to be blocked by a half circle of eight of the hooded, hooded lantern bearers. All of them bore lanterns except for one, which held up a disembodied head by its raven's hair. Charlotte's head. Poppy's throat clamped so tight she couldn't breathe. The creature swung its third arm and tossed the head at Poppy's feet. She stumbled backward into the shadow of the lo looming nightmare. Where's Atticus? She was alone, alone and trapped. Tears welled in her eyes. She couldn't help but gaze upon Charlotte's dead eyes. Then she gripped her brass key tight and turned to face the towering entity. A grim resolve swelled in her heart. Was this fiction or reality? It didn't matter anymore. Dream or no dream, she would never forgive herself if she gave up now. What would Sailor Moon do? Transform, obviously. She'd use her brooch to transform and then throw her tiara at it. Duh. Immediately, the brass key she held began to glow and its shape changed. The brass lengthened and flattened at the tip. Its teeth melted into a fine edge. The Victorian pattern along the handle unfolded to become a delicate basket hilt that wrapped around Poppy's knuckles. A sword? The poem reverberated in her head. Its blade is ever so sharp. Wield it and thou may sharpen thyself as well. The huge creature chittered and hummed a grating tune as it raised several of its legs to strike. Poppy shoved her way past the, one of the lantern wielders and ran to the tree line for cover. The thing's talons drove into the ground where she had been standing. Another blood-soaked leg came up from the sea and swatted at her. She lifted her sword in front of her face reflexively. The leg connected with her blade and instantly severed in two. The talon end clattered to the ground and rolled to her feet. The nightmare reeled back and shrieked with pain. She looked in awe at the brass blade. She hadn't even swung it. It was razor sharp. The ring of hooded min minions advanced, closing in around her. Realizing the power of her weapon, the drifter stood her ground. In the bright light of the red moon, she saw that each of them had the same face, the gnarled, twisted countenance of not Aunt Caitlin, and each of them wielded a pair of hedge clippers. Come closer! The drifter yelled in a crackling voice, clutching her shimmering brand with trembling hands. I double dare you! They accepted. Poppy swung at the nearest one and cleaved off its two outstretched arm at the elbows. A pair of rusty hedge clippers clattered to the ground. She twirled and pierced the torso of another. Somehow these movements came to, as naturally to her as breathing. Scarlet moonlight gleamed from her blood-splashed edge as she pirouetted. A third creature dove forward from the side and snapped its weapon at her with a chilling grating of rusting metal. Crouching at one-third the creature's height, she easily ducked its attack, then rose with a wide diagonal slash. The top half of the creature's torso slid off the bottom with a sickening schlick. Panting and blood-drenched, Poppy turned to face the nightmare itself. What are you? She yelled over the shrill noise of incessant humming. Why do you hate Charlotte so much? Um, and what follows is... 
uh, the creature's response, which we won't even like bother trying to replicate here because um, it's a almost a full page of gobbledygook. So <laughs> it answered. Poppy had never heard a nightmare speak before. More dreadful than the humming, this sound shook her to her core. Her hands trembled. Her knees wobbled. The force of the thing's hideous voice nearly made her wretch. Yeah, and? She replied, her voice wavering. She clenched the hilt of her sword tight enough to make her knuckles go pale. Is that all you got? The nightmare came at her with all of its limbs, each dripping venom and long enough to penetrate the earth and sharp enough to rend Poppy apart, skin, flesh, and bone. She wove between them, ducked under them, dove past them, slashing at each of the thing's many talons with each step she took. Nothing seemed to slow the nightmare down. Even when her blade struck true, even when she severed a limb and sent it writhing to the ground, more appeared and flailed at her. But there had to be a way. It had to have a weak point. The only place she had ever fought a giant monster before was inside the tiny CRTV in her attic, with a Super Nintendo controller in her hand. The drifter examined her blade. If she could transform her key with but a thought, what else could she do? What other powers could she possess? Was her imagination her only limitation? Poppy pulled her arm back and swung her sword across her chest in a horizontal cut, imagining herself as Link from The Legend of Zelda, and her blade to be the master sword. If Link was at full health, a beam of energy would shoot out from his blade and hit anything at a distance. And to her surprise, the tip of the blade shone bright blue. Its glow coalesced into a crescent as her blade arced in front of her. As soon as she completed her swing, the crescent launched forward, weaving between, weaving between two of the creature's limbs and slicing directly through its body. Holy crap. Did that actually work? The top half of the nightmare tumbled backward into the ocean. Instead of sinking beneath the surface, it formed a hole as it landed and pierced a rift through the dream realm. Blood surged through the rift. A cobweb of cracks tore through the street and ripped chunks of the earth apart. The other half of the nightmare slid into the ether as, she, as the earth shook. A tidal wave of blood rose high into the sky. It crested over the trees and buildings, ominous and grim. She had only enough time to raise her blade in a defensive posture. Then the wall of crimson crashed down on top of her. Puppy! She was being shaken. No, wait. It was the opposite. She was seizing. Her body was clenched, and two warm hands gripped her shoulders as she shook. Poppy, wake up! Poppy! It was Charlotte's voice. Poppy's eyes opened, and the seizure stopped. She shot up at once. She was back in Charlotte's room. Not the version with the baseball posters and the weird blurry documents on her desk, but Charlotte's actual bedroom. Bright daylight shone through the window instead of crimson moonlight. She heard birds chirping, not the discordant humming of nightmarish killers. Dixie sat nearby, watching the scene unfold with cat-like apathy. More importantly, Charlotte was there, peering into Poppy's wide, wet eyes with a combination of surprise, fear, and awe. Poppy gasped in her relief, wrapping her arms around the girl, and sobbed uncontrollably. All right. Very nice. Uh, so that was chapter eight. We've got just three chapters left. Uh, and we started, what, at six? So we're making good time. Good job, everyone. All right. <clears throat> so chapter nine, um, I will be narrating. Um, I'm narrating a Poppy Charlotte chapter for once. Yay! Uh, Mora is going to be Charlotte. Uh, Poppy will be uh, Caitlin and good old Aunt Catelyn is going to be Chris. Um, normal Aunt Catelyn this time. Um, are we good to go? Do we need to take a break or anything? I know I keep asking, but I want to make sure that everyone's comfy. Okay, cool. Uh, let me just pull it up. Boop, boop, boop. All right. Chapter 9. Charlotte. The first time you see the world through a cat's eyes, you will never see the world the same way again. The first time you see the world through a dark eyes, 
you will never see yourself the same way again. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. Charlotte was bewildered by Poppy's explosion of emotions. She held on to her in awkward silence, waiting for the girl's breathing to settle again. From downstairs, Aunt Catelyn called out to them in her usual shrill voice. What's going on up there? Are you two still doing homework? Poppy jumped back and wiped her tears away. Charlotte called out, Yes, Auntie. And scrambled to arrange their notebooks and papers on the carpet, just in case Aunt Catelyn came upstairs. Sorry. Poppy said, right on cue. What happened? Did you have a scary dream? Poppy nodded. Charlotte had seen her wake up like this before. Typically, she would straighten with a jolt and a, gra and a gasp, and the kids would have a good laugh, and then the teacher would tell them all to quiet down. Sometimes Poppy would yelp out something weird or fall out of her chair, and it always seemed a little silly, but this, the terrified expression on her face, the way her hands were trembling, this was different. Also, her right ear was bleeding, which was unusual. Even stranger still, the necklace she'd been wearing all day, that new one with the crescent moon pendant, seemed to have disappeared. Charlotte decided to take Poppy to the bathroom to wash up. It took some time to convince the redhead to leave the room. She resisted Charlotte's every step with wobbly knees and wide, tear-filled eyes that kept darting about, scanning her surroundings like she thought she was being watched. It's been a heck of a nightmare. When they reached the bathroom on the second floor, Poppy shook her head, wrenched herself free, and backed away from the door. What? It's just a bathroom, Charlotte said, nudging the door open. Poppy winced as it swung inward. Charlotte looked in. As far as she could tell, they had a normal bathroom. Drab yellow tile, dull yellow bathtub, medicine cabinet, mirror, the usual. Poppy gulped down her fear and allowed Charlotte to lead her inside. Charlotte watched as Poppy splashed water on her face, pulled a tangled mess of red hair away from her eyes, and blotted her ear with a sheet of tissue paper. Something in Poppy's shirt clinked against the bathroom counter as she leaned over it. She pulled the opening of her sleeve wider, and a small brass key tumbled out. Poppy shivered as she stared at it. She snatched it up and stuck it in the waistband of her skirt, glancing sidelong at Charlotte in suspicion. Are you okay? Charlotte whispered. Poppy opened her mouth to explain, then shut it just as quickly. Was it, was it like the other night? Your dream? Your dream, I mean? The girl nodded, then frowned and shook her head. Did you see Atticus again? Poppy nodded and stared at her reflection. She reached up and groped around her neck where that necklace had been just a few minutes prior. Even she doesn't know where it went? Charlotte bit her lip and nervously rubbed her elbow. She didn't like this feeling. She liked solving mysteries, not being stumped. Maybe we should get back to doing some homework, she offered. Poppy nodded again. Charlotte led Poppy out of the bathroom, but suddenly the girl froze in the hallway, halfway to Charlotte's room. Her eyes widened. No way. Her voice choked. That's... That, that's impossible. What, what's impossible? Poppy, tell me what's... She followed Poppy's line of sight. Poppy was staring at a framed photo across from the bathroom, one Charlotte knew well. One with two boys, both pale and blonde, wearing white and blue baseball jerseys. It was a photo Charlotte didn't like looking at. It brought up painful memories. This, this is impossible. Poppy pointed to the two boys in the photo. Charlotte put a finger to her mouth, glanced downstairs, and then ushered the other girl back into her room. She pushed the door so it was almost shut. My auntie will kill us. For some reason, those words caused Poppy to wince. <laughs> she leaned in and whispered. That photo. That photo. Mike. That photo. That exact photo. It was in my dream. So what? Charlotte replied. It's just a photo. I've never seen it before now. How could I dream about something I never saw? You must have spotted it on the way in, Charlotte reasoned. It's the only logical explanation. Okay, fine then. I'll prove it. Poppy took a deep breath. This isn't your room. It used to belong to the boys in this photo. Your auntie and uncle must have repainted the room when you moved in. Downstairs, there's a kitchen and a living room. The furniture is all new. There used to be a different couch, and the table used to be wooden, but now it's all glass. And below that, the den is only half carpeted because rain floods through the glass door at the back. 
Oh, and there's a wooden block that keeps the door from opening, even when it's unlocked, so people can't break in. Charlotte stood dumbfounded, covering her mouth. They hadn't gone downstairs at all. How could Poppy possibly know any of that? How? How? I told you I was there. Poppy whispered furiously. I saw it all in my dream. How is that possible? Wait, would she have... No. Charlotte bit her lip. You saw it in my dream. It sounded correct as she said it. It was the only thing that made sense, even if it made no sense. A long pause hung between them. Poppy's brow furrowed in confusion. Oh, sorry, that line's not highlighted. That's you. <laughs> uh, Caitlin. Oh. <laughs> what? You, you fell asleep on my shoulder, and I didn't want to wake you up. So I tried to get some homework done with my free hand, but then I started to get sleepy, too. So I set you down and took a nap. It was certainly the first time Charlotte remembered ever falling asleep while working with numbers. I had this weird dream. I don't really remember much of it, to be honest. I was in my house, but it was different, like when I first moved in. All the furniture and stuff, just like you said. She shook her head, her memory of the dream fuzzy and incomplete. I don't know what happened next. I kind of remember my aunt's gardening tools in the garage, I guess. It doesn't really make sense. But anyway, next thing I know, I'm awake. I don't think I was asleep for very long. I went back to work, and then a few minutes later, you started, um, freaking out in your sleep. So I woke you up. Poppy stood quietly, thinking. Her lips were twisted in a quivering, horrified grimace. So oh, I was in your head? She folded her arms and took a step away from Charlotte. I, I swear, I, I didn't mean to. I mean, I didn't know. Is that even possible? It's okay. I, I know you have no control over... It's not okay. Poppy blurted out, meeting Charlotte's gaze. She so rarely made eye contact that it was unnerving. There, Charlotte saw that presence again. The slow, steady whirling of something dark blotting out the sapphire blue of Poppy's eyes. It's not okay at all. I snuck into your mind. That's like reading someone's diary. No, worse. Charlotte shook her head and tried to grab Poppy's shoulders, but the girl had retreated to the, ed of the edge of Charlotte's bunk bed. She stared at the space below it, almost longingly. Look, Poppy, if there's anybody I'd trust to read my diary, it's you. That felt like the right thing to say. It wasn't. The dark shape in Poppy's eyes grew and pranced merrily around the edges of her irises. You shouldn't trust me. With a swift motion, she kicked open the marble notebook that lay on the ground between them. It flipped to a random page. In the margin, she had drawn an alien with a bulbous head and three beady eyes. All of this. I see it in my dreams. But I guess I'm just in other people's heads the whole time. Like some kind of intruder. It's wrong. Poppy trembled. She looked small and vulnerable. Her face nodded with despair. Everyone is right about me. I'm a freak. Hey, no, you're not. And you... Charlotte started, but her words were interrupted by the sound of her aunt humming to herself from downstairs as she prepared supper. Poppy froze in terror at the melody. Her face was pale as a ghost. Before Charlotte could say another word, Poppy grabbed her notebook, stuffed it into her backpack, and rushed for the door. Her, hair, her hand trembled so hard it was a wonder she could grip the doorknob. Charlotte followed her down the stairs, trying to convince her to stay. Nothing she said seemed to reach her. When Poppy entered the living room, she glanced at the blanket thrown over the cushions of the couch, and she ran out the front door with such revulsion that Charlotte wondered if she'd seen a hundred scuttling cockroaches instead. Poppy, wait! But Poppy was gone. Why? What did I do wrong? Charlotte stared at the front door for a solid minute as silence once again pervaded the household. Silence and her aunt's insipid humming. Come, um, dear. It's almost time for supper. Aunt Kotlin uh, called to her, but Charlotte continued to stare at the door. Something dark gnawed at her insides. She didn't eat supper that night. Ooh. Okay, just two chapters left. Home stretch. 
All right, chapter 10. Josh, you good to go? Okay, this time Josh will be playing the role of the narrator slash Penelope. This is another first person chapter. I will be playing the role of Atsuko. Uh, oh, I forgot that I took this role from you. <laughs> yeah, have fun with that. Okay, I think I'm ready. All right, and um, uh, Tim will be playing the role of uh, of uh, Penelope's girlfriend, uh, Emerald Wings, in chat form. All right, let me just pull this up. Okay, uh, I'm ready if you guys are. Okay. Chapter 10, Penelope. Every encounter with the nightmare causes it to grow. As the darkness grows, so too does the Mara's dismay. When the Mara has no more hope, the cycle is complete. The Mara is no more, and a new nightmare is born. Excerpt from a Drifter's Book of Rites. I'm in my bed, blinking sleep out of my eyes. I can hear water running from the tiny, meager bathroom across my bedroom. I was in that playground. How the hell did I get there? Last I remembered, it, I found the perfect little place to add to my dream city, and then... I shudder as I remember the nightmare that clawed its way into my dreams. Damn it. Damn everything. I throw my covers against the wall and climb to my feet. Why hadn't the dream kept me safe? I'm still wearing the same t-shirt, jeans, and zipped-up raincoat I had on when I'd left school yesterday. Light streams in through the curtains of my bedroom. The digital clock next to my bed reads 11.17 a.m. Okinakuri no kinoshita de anata to watashi. That singing is familiar and obnoxious. My classmate Atsuko came here with me from America, but she knows all kinds of silly Japanese songs from her childhood. I wish I knew what they meant. She'd be the perfect tutor for me if if she hadn't had the uh, if she had the discipline for it. At least I know I understand how I wound up back in my apartment. Atsuko, god damn it, I call out. I was fine on my own. The singing stops and the faucet switches off. Sato Atsuko steps into my room, drying off her hands with one of my hand towels. She narrows her eyes, which accentuates her sharp, angular face, and replies matter-of-factly, No, you weren't fine at all. I absently scratched my arm. I've messed up big time. I lied to both of them, and now I'm pushing them both away. And yet, even knowing this, I can't stop myself. How would you even find me anyway, I ask, quieter. She tugs at her long side ponytail in exasperation. How do you think? It's not like I have a tracking device on your phone. I literally just wandered around Kabuki Cho until I found you in that park. I tried to wake you up, but you were dead to the world, so I carried you back here. You're lucky I left weights. <laughs> it's true. For a thin, angular, five foot five inch woman, she's surprisingly strong. I've caught sight of her once or twice through the windows of our university's gym doing her kickboxing routine. She could probably kick my ass if she wanted to. I'm about to apologize for causing so much trouble, but before I can, the thing inside me devours my words chews them up, and spits them out differently. Why should I apologize? It's not like I asked to be found. None of your business anyway. Why don't you just go home and leave me the hell alone? You're not my goddamn mom. Those words seem a lot easier than an apology. So easy, in fact, I don't realize I've been speaking out loud until I see the expression on Asuka's face. She huffs and turns to leave. Good. Like I said, none of her business. I cover my head with my palm and push my fingers deep into my eyes to rub away the darkness inside my head. No, wait, I call out. My voice cracks with unbridled emotion. Please, don't leave. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not leaving, Baka. 
She calls back from my bathroom. She reemerges moments later holding a box of tissues and holds it out to me as if it means something. Go ahead. Why? I reply. I, I don't need tissues. Only then do I notice the way the breeze from my windows feels colder on my cheeks, where my tears haven't dried. How long was I crying for? I yank a few tissues from the box, wipe my eyes, and blow my nose. Then I sit on the edge of my futon and stare at the tatami mat below my feet. Why am I like this, Otsuko? Why don't you start from the beginning? You told me you've always had issues sleeping. <laughs> That's an understatement. But, I interrupt. But when did all this begin? All the sneaking off at night or whatever? She pauses. Her voice becomes softer. Your nightmares are worse than normal, aren't they? My throat tightens. I swallow a ball of hopelessness. I could tell lots go everything. I could tell her how there's only one person who can make the nightmares go away. And I've left her all the way back in America. I could tell her how they've gotten so bad that I'm afraid of falling asleep at night. How I've kept myself awake by any method possible. How the insomnia has affected everything from my grades to my social life to my fraying relationship with my girlfriend. I want to tell her everything. I really, really do. I... It, it's, it's nothing. Just my usual bad dreams. You know, like I always get. Like you said. Coward. Liar. No, this is different. Otsuko replies, hands on her hips. <laughs> Look, I know we only met like last year, but even I know you well enough to know you're not acting like normal. And I'm not the only one worried about you, you know? I know who she's talking about. The brilliant, gorgeous girl waiting for me across the ocean, worried sick for my safety, wondering what she could be doing differently. The tears threatened to come flooding back. She's probably overthinking all of this, stressing herself out to no end. She wants nothing to do with me anymore. She deserves better. Somebody normal. A fractured part of me, that horrible voice in the dark resources of my mind, tells me what to say. And I listen. You know what? You're wrong. You don't know me at all, Otsuko. I snap, raising my, to my feet. Maybe nobody knows me. But guess what? That's no different than it's ever been for me. Just par for the goddamn course. So just leave me to hell alone and go bother one of your other friends, okay? Otsuko stares silently into my eyes for a moment, as if she's searching for something. What? I bark. What are you looking at? All right, fine. She says at last and walks away. Text me if you change your mind. Janet. The door shuts loudly behind her. I'm alone again. Alone with my thoughts and the darkness that dwells within them. The voice contradicts my feelings of guilt. Who needs her? It offers. You're better off without her. My phone buzzes three times on the night table next to my futon. Atsuko must have turned it on while I, while I was asleep. I reach over, over and lift up the screen to read. Private message received Thursday, October 18th at 10.09 a.m. Emerald Wings. Hun? Are you there? Please call me when you get this. I need to hear your voice. Please, don't shut me out. Shut up! I grip it tight, spin, and hurl it across the room. By some cruel twist of fate, it strikes my favorite photograph of the two of us. The one I took during our vacation to Disney World last year. The glass shatters. The frame tumbles off my dresser and onto the tatami mat below. No! I cry out. I rush over and frantically pick up the pieces of the broken frame. No, 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 please, no, I beg, but it's too late. The damage is done. Why? Why am I even listening to this voice? 
I stare at my dim reflection in the cracked glass. This time, I see the circle of darkness that swells inside my irises. The poison that threatens to consume me. Body, mind, and soul. <laughs> All right. I never know what to say in between chapters. Okay, so final chapter. I hope you're all having fun uh, listening to this. I hope you're, I hope you want answers um, because if you keep listening, maybe you'll get some. <laughs> all right, so chapter 11, uh, we've got Mora is going to be narrating for the first time. Uh, Caitlin is going to be playing the role of Poppy. Lenny is going to be playing the role of a character who has yet to show up yet. Uh, and I will be playing the role of a strange, weird dream vision. <laughs> All right. Are we good to go? All right. Ready. Yeah, no breaks. We don't need breaks. <laughs> it's fine. It's been great. It's been awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Let's do it. All right. Chapter 11, Poppy. A drifter must be prepared for any dream at any time. Sometimes you'll descend willingly into the infinite dreamscape. The rest of the time, well, that is why we call it drifting. Excerpt from a drifter's book of rights. Once again, Poppy was in another world. This time she found herself on a stone balcony overlooking a vast city of bright neon lights. It was night, or something like it. There were no stars, sun, or moon overhead, just a blanket of inky darkness consuming the colorful glow of the city. Thin, gentle rain pattered on the rooftop above her. The drifter leaned over the edge of the balcony and looked down. She hadn't been up a building this tall since Daddy took her to the Empire State Building. For all she knew, this building was twice as tall. The ground was shrouded by an ashen mist that blotted out the bright neon oranges, pinks, and greens. She craned her neck to look up, past the ceiling of the balcony. The tower continued up, hundreds of stories, disappearing into the dark, rainy sky. A wave of vertigo assaulted her. The city was filled with similar skyscrapers, each one covered in bright neon signs in Japanese. She recognized the language from her Sailor Moon tapes, although she couldn't read a word of it. Between these towers, the city was a maze of cluttered storefronts and dazzling, boisterous billboards. Only the hint of golden street lamps radiated the mist below. How the hell did I get here? She remembered running from Charlotte's house in distress. That's right. I messed everything up. Just like I knew I would. Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Why can't you just be normal? Why? It had been dark. Far darker than it should have been. She had no clue how to get home from Charlotte's house, so she'd wandered past, uh, back to the park they passed on the way. It wasn't much, just a tiny wooded path that led to a small cobblestone bridge spanning a shallow lake. She'd leaned, she'd leaned against the railing and watched the fish circle one another until the tears came. She must have fallen asleep right there. Her hands trembled as they gripped the railing of the skyscraper balcony. In the real world, she's probably draped over the railing of that bridge in the same way. It's not fair. I can't control this. I can never ever have a friend. Not the way I am. Not with these dreams. Never. The last time she dreamt she was in Charlotte's dream. Maybe she was in somebody else's dream right now? She peered behind her into the apartment. Maybe the person who lives inside here? She snuck inside and was surprised at how comfortable the place looked, especially compared to the last nightmare. A soft white couch sat facing a television screen larger than Poppy had ever laid eyes on. The stand below the TV held an assortment of advanced electronic devices, none of which used cassettes or tapes. She admired them with envy. One of the machines even had a Nintendo logo on it, although she'd never seen anything like it in any issue of Nintendo Power. She discovered other rooms. An open-air kitchen with a long marble countertop, a tiled bathroom that smelled of strawberries and vanilla, and a bedroom dominated by a tall bed with pink bedsheets and matching fluffy pillows. Across from the bed stood a wide dresser, the drawers of which were brimming with unsorted, unfolded clothes, tank tops, t-shirts, shorts, leggings, lingerie, the works. 
past the dresser, she found a walk-in closet filled with beautiful skirts, dresses, and coats, the likes of which she'd never seen. On the other side of the room, a small shelf was filled with assorted trinkets, a porcelain elephant, a snow globe, a miniature bust of a fairy tale castle, and more than a few chibi anime figurines. Some she recognized, many she didn't. She picked up the castle. It looked like something out of Disney World, with white walls covered in strange blue ivy, and many towers with conical roofs, one of which had snapped off. Through the hole, she saw an empty throne room, devoid of detail. She couldn't help but smile as she set it back on the shelf, feeling an odd kinship with the broken thing. She liked this person's taste, but the longer she explored the apartment, the more conflicted she felt. I'm not supposed to be here. This is somebody else's dream. She was about to leave when she noticed the picture frame on the dresser. The glass was cracked but repaired with glue and scotch tape. The photo showed two teenage girls standing on a cobblestone street in the Magic Kingdom. One was mousy with bright pink hair and had her arms wrapped around another girl, tall and slender, with long black hair and brown skin tanned dark by the hot sun. There's something familiar about the way the taller girl's coal black hair tumbled through the wind. Then her eyes throbbed and her, her vision swept away and once again she saw... The infinite staircase spirals through the end of all known things. The world between worlds. Here is the climber's task. An obelisk that pierces through the drift itself. Its surface is smooth, black, and alien. None know how it came to be. No drifter has ever scaled it. It is off limits to those burdened by cat eyes such as her. Still, she climbs. Higher and higher. The obelisk soars and twists through endless darkness, dark as the void beyond night, dark as the night beyond void. Here is the climber's worst nightmare. Far above, a storm rages, echoing her own tumultuous thoughts. She has traversed an infinite distance and has several more infinities to go. Still, she can hear that bell tolling, clang, clang, clang. Blood falls from above, from the endless ocean, the primordial soup from which all nightmares are born. Drip, drip, drip. Here is the climber's final destination. An eye opens under the surface. It knows she is coming. It is ready. It hungers. Poppy rose from the carpet, panting and sweating like she'd run a whole mile. That, that obelisk again, that whirlpool of blood. A familiar nagging sensation tugged at her. It felt like a word was on the tip of her tongue. That lady climbing the tower I keep seeing. That's her in this picture. The image of the two girls, happy and warm and devoted to one another, made her feel empty inside. Her eyes glimmered. Why can't I have a friend like that? A tear dripped onto the picture. She wiped the glass, reverently placed the frame back on the dresser, and looked away. To her surprise, something light landed on the bed next to her and bumped against her elbow. She turned to see two piercing yellow eyes staring back at her, somehow concerned and uncaring at the same time. Clutched in his mouth was that silver necklace again. Yes? Poppy's voice cracked as she greeted him. In response, the black cat opened its mouth and dropped the crescent moon pendant onto the bed next to her. It looked up at her expectantly. Why do you keep giving me this, kitty? You know it's yours, right? Even so, she picked it up and fastened it to her neck. It must be important if he wants me to have it. She ran her fingers through Atticus's fur. All right, come on. We have to go. This isn't our home. At this, Atticus gave her a curious glance. Poppy walked to the bathroom and looked at herself in the mirror, wiping, eye wiping tears from her eyes. She was almost disappointed to find that it was still her who stared back. She wished she could be that girl from the photograph instead. The girl with the pink hair and the confident smile. The girl with the doting friend. Atticus leapt onto the counter and stepped in front of the mirror, as if to divert her attention, gazing into her eyes with his own bright yellow orbs. Shh. 
Are you, are you, sorry. <laughs> she wondered aloud. He replied with a long, chirping meow. What's that mean, little kitty? Black Cat turned and pawed at the surface of the mirror. Feeling silly, Poppy did the same. The moment she touched the glass with her fingertip, fingertips, it rippled like the surface of a pool of water. She saw her pupils changing, becoming cat-like. When the glass settled, it reflected precisely what she wanted it to reflect. She was older, but not that much taller. Her hair was dyed bright pink and cut in a short bob, with two curls on either side of her cheeks, her ears poking up behind them. Her eyelashes were larger, her chin longer, and her cheeks a little rounder, with dimples above the curves of her lips when she smiled. Her balance felt different, and she looked down at her body. She was wearing the same outfit as the girl in the photograph, light blue denim shorts, a pink button-up cardigan, and a black tank top underneath. Like an alternate costume in a video game. Or like Sailor Moon's disguise power. She beamed with pride. Poppy took one last look around the apartment before leaving. Atticus slipped through the door as it closed. You know, every time you're around, things seem to go wrong. She observed out loud. Maybe I shouldn't go anywhere. Maybe I should just stay here until I wake up. To her surprise, he leaped onto her shoulder and meowed directly into her ear in protest. If you say so. Poppy replied with a chuckle. Dim fluorescent light filled the hallway outside. She noted the number and nameplate on the door. Apartment 14514. Something There's some Japanese, Japanese text. <laughs> <laughs> it read, <laughs> which was indecipherable to her. Time to find a way out of this building. Every other door she, pla she passed was similarly numbered, though none of them bore a nameplate. The hallway end ended at a cramped, steep staircase of gray stone. She descended flight after flight after flight, wondering how a city like this could possibly survive without elevators. When she finally reached the bottom, there was no lobby, just a windowless metal door. She opened it and stepped out into the wet, foggy street. She didn't know where she was headed, but hoped it would become clear enough. The uncountable mess of tall buildings around her was overwhelming. Neon towers that rose into the mist and bathed the streets with all kinds of colorful hues. She turned to examine the building she'd just exited and was startled to find vivid artwork covering the front of the apartment complex, all drawn in bright pastel chalk. It was different from any graffiti she'd ever seen, a beautiful illustration that only enhanced the building's allure. In the very center of the piece, emblazoned upon the door, stood a perfect rendition of a black cat. Its pupils were vertical slits over a sea of bright yellow, just like Atticus's. Just like hers when she looked in the mirror upstairs. Atticus clung to her shoulder tightly and observed the portrait with something between disinterest and pride. Movement caught Poppy's eye and she jerked around. This was not an empty city. Throngs of people milled past along the too narrow sidewalk, their faces illuminated by the soft glow emanating from the flat devices they studied while walking. They avoided her as she stood there. The streets were wide enough for four cars to pass by one another, but there were no dotted lines, no traffic lights, no stop signs, and, as far as Poppy could tell, no cars either. With no clue where else to go, she simply chose a direction and walked. Droplets of rain emerged from the curtain of mist to pelt her brand new clothes. For such a crowded city, it was awfully quiet. Pedestrians spoke sparingly and in hushed voices, scarcely louder than the quiet pattern of, patter of rain. Poppy's hometown was a small suburban town, bordering the Long Island Sound, with barely any building over two stories. In contrast, this neon city was an endless, sprawling metropolis. Each street corner yielded a new trove of avenues to explore, new window displays to marvel at, and new faces to stare at. She passed countless weird storefronts, each with a bright neon, neon sign. A flower shop was selling undesirable, invasive vines and weeds, which looked like they belonged in a dumpster. A frozen yogurt, plate, yogurt place similar to the one at the Newport Mall had flavors like youth, beauty, and tranquility. Endless vines and exotic plants hung from the balconies above the sidewalk. Poppy spotted something and jerked to a halt. 
the symbol etched into the glass of the window next to her, a glimmering crescent moon. She lifted the silver pendant attached to her necklace and compared the two. They were one and the same. I guess. Is this what you wanted me to see? The neon image of a cat drinking milk out of a wide coffee mug flashed above the entrance, but the storefront had no other signage, nor any name to identify it. She peered through the window of the cafe, placing her hands around her cheeks and pressing her face up against the glass so she could see better. It was a tiny place with a long countertop. Behind the counter sat complicated coffee machines, along with a tall cabinet filled with an assortment of jars. There were no customers, but behind a row of unoccupied stools, Poppy noted carpeted platforms along the wall where cats lounged about lazily. A cat cafe. Poppy couldn't help but smile. She'd never had a cup of coffee before, aside from sipping her mom's gross, bitter morning mug, but she felt drawn to look inside. A cat's curiosity, some strange sense of warmth and kinship. Atticus leapt off Poppy's shoulders and slipped through the doorway the moment she opened it. He leaped onto the countertop as if he owned the place, licking his front paws with pride. The other cats regarded him without a second thought, like they were old friends. A buzzer sounded behind the counter as she entered, and an elderly man emerged from the back room, muttering amiably to himself. His skin was a rich, deep brown with bronze undertones that shone in the cafe's warm light, and his beard was long, black, and speckled with scraggly white strands. Long bags hung under his eyes, a web of wrinkles extending outward on either side. Why, hello there, he said without looking at Poppy. I do not believe we have met. His voice was deep and smooth. He spoke carefully, with intent and purpose. Poppy leaned against the counter, a trickle of rainwater running off her coat onto the varnished wood. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm new here. I'm kind of lost. She unclasped the silver chain from her neck and placed it on the countertop. Its crescent moon shone against the room's pale lighting. But I have this here, and... The roaring hiss of the espresso machine drowned her words out. She waited impatiently, fidgeting, and picking at her fingers. Moments later, the man placed a wide mug of latte into the count uh, onto the counter and slid it toward Poppy. A cat's face was drawn in the white upon its foam. He plucked the necklace from the countertop and examined the pendant, running his fingers, his aged fingers, over the surface. Where did you get this? She pointed to Atticus. He gave it to me. The barista chuckled. His laughter was deep, warm, and cozy. <laughs> I see, he said at last, placing the collar back around Atticus's neck. The cat allowed the man to do so, arching his neck proudly. In that case, he did a very good job leading you here. But why? And what is here, anyway? Poppy asked, looking out the window again. This city is enormous. There must be like a million people living here. Indeed there are. In fact, many hundred million live in the Neon City. The elderly man replied. Is it all real? Poppy wondered aloud. Everything in the drift is real. He replied in a snap, then quietly added. And yet, it is also an illusion. It is everything you and I have ever experienced, and yet nothing at the same time. It is completely meaningless, and yet... It is absolutely vital. He spoke these words as if they were known to him already, like the recitation of a poem, like a riddle passed down from one to another. Though she'd never heard them before, the words rang with sincerity. What did you say? She asked. The barista's narrow gaze met hers harshly. The truth, he replied. You were led here for a reason, because it is where you needed to be. Because the world is not what you think it is, and you are not what you think you are. And that's the end of Act One. <laughs> Woo! That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, can I have everyone uh, on cams or like we can chat real quick? Um, wow. So I can't believe this actually worked. Thank you so much to everyone who. Who joined um so if you're uh curious and you want to know more 
Uh, again, feel free to hop on my website, um, bewaretheblackcat.com. Maybe you know a little bit of why that's my website now. <laughs> and um, you can feel free to download it. Otherwise, I would love to keep doing this. Um, yeah. So we can, yeah, we can keep organizing this, maybe do another one. Uh, but yeah, until then, everybody, like, round of applause. Honestly, take a bow. Yeah, y'all did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Um, and it's it's so good. Uh, it was so good, Lenny, to have Automonk in there at the end. You did a really great job with that. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, this yeah, um, this book is a challenge with audio because there's so many little visual tricks. There's like the Japanese and the nightmare text and all the visions and wacky stuff. So, um, you guys did a, a bang up job. Uh, did anybody have any parting words? Uh, great job writing it, Max. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> um, if you're watching and you're not in the Dark Drifters Discord server, uh, you can find a link on my Twitter um, and on my website. Um, definitely hop in there. You can chat with people. Um, I'm doing previews for book two and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it should be fun. So yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining. And I will see you next time. Thanks, that Bye. was lots of fun. Thanks. Bye. This was super fun. Bye. Bye.